publish the second of our Brexit directives, a letter to the Mayor suggesting areas for him to raise in his regular discussions with the Right Honourable David Davis, Secretary of State for exiting the EU. It also called on the Mayor to publish a Brexit strategy for London. We also heard from the Mayor, Lord Heseltine, and experts on EU funding about some of the current challenges and possible responses from the GLA and the Mayor. And the Assembly received a very positive response from Mayor Carr, Mayor Khan to our work highlighting the issues facing EU nationals living in London. Finally, many thanks to all Assembly members for joining with Assembly Member Duval to encourage MPs to register the concept of a, no, to support uh, the concept of a domestic abusers register. We will be taking this important work forward in the coming weeks and months in order to push, push for a much needed change to the law. Thank you, members. Can I go on now to item two? Can I ask the Assembly to note the recommendation set out at item two? Do members have any other declarations to make relevant to the items on the agenda for today's meeting, including in relations to gifts and hospitality, which are not yet reflected on the authorities' register? Um, Assembly Member Boff? Uh, one piece of hospitality from a company called Vault Face. Uh, it was only two days ago, so I haven't had time to enter into for about 50 quid. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, declared dinner with um, Pocket Living. I can't remember if it's gone on yet, so I'll declare it for... Isn't it only if it's relevant? It's only if it's relevant to the business no. um, Relevant to today's meeting, yes, Assembly Member Prince? Discussing the LDCC, I will be... I am a member, I am a member of the West Ham United Football Club and uh, I'm obviously a supporter and I just feel for clarity it's worth that letting... should be that should be read on your register already is there anything new in regard to today's meeting hmm? no. It's okay. not actually, no it's not actually in fact as um, assembly member prince has declared then I feel mm -hmm. I should just make people aware that I'm a season ticket holder of yes, West Ham I don't think I have to you but, don't. but because you've done <coughs> Because yeah. that assembly member has done what he's done, I feel I ought to share that with the meeting. <laughs> yeah. That's what I should declare. I saw West Ham on Saturday. I declare that. Yeah. 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 Perhaps we should just provide a little bit of guidance to say if it's a football matter on the agenda, then we would expect it to have been registered before the meeting. Well, the stadium is relevant. I didn't need to declare for today. Okay. I did see it's guys. An opportunity. I didn't need um, to. Assembly Member Desai. Well, I wasn't going to come in, but now I'm since following Assembly Member <laughs> Prince and Assembly Member Dual. Can I say that um, I'm also a trustee of the West Ham United Foundation? Thank you. Let us go to the minutes. Can I ask the Assembly to agree the minutes of the London Assembly Mayor's Question Time meeting held on 12 October 2017 to be signed by me as a correct record? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Let's go to item four, a Q&A session with the London Legacy Development Corporation, and we'll be referring to it, I'm sure, as the LLDC. Uh, before, um, yeah, and... Um, that's the principal business of today's meeting. Um, so let me formally welcome the um, LLDC's um, Chief Executive, um, Mr. David Goldstone, CB. Good morning, David. Thank you. And um, welcome to his first meeting in his new role as Chairman of the LLDC, Sir Peter Hendy, CBE. Thank you. Uh, welcome to the meeting to both of you. Now, Assembly members have, of course, met Sir Peter many times, but as I've just said, it's his first appearance before the full Assembly in his role as Chair of uh, LLDC. As members know, the LLDC appear before the Assembly on a regular basis. The Assembly had a plenary session with um, David and Sir Peter's predecessor, David Edmonds, on March 2016. 
and the LLDC appeared before the Assembly's Budget and Performance Committee and the Budget Monitoring Subcommittee in January 2016, December 2016, January 2017, and a few weeks ago on 18th October. Members will know that there are a range of significant issues facing the LLDC currently, including those relating to the um, matters on the agenda. Um, there are four lead-off questions set out on the order paper, and Assembly members may ask supplementary questions after each question has been answered. Before taking the lead-off question, the Assembly will now receive a short opening statement from the Chair and Chief Exec of the LLDC for up to five minutes in total. Over to you, Sir Peter. Okay, thank you. So, um, uh, you're right, I haven't been to one of these <clears throat> in this uh, position before, but I did have a confirmation hearing some uh, weeks ago, uh, and what I said then is still true, which is that I, I haven't been to the uh, Olympic Park or Stratford since 2012, and the scale of what has happened there since, uh, since um, then, when I went back this summer, I find it is just staggering. Uh, I've been in the job three months, I've met lots of people, I met hundreds of people at the recent event uh, here east with the Evening Standard, um, and there's a huge amount of enthusiasm about the future of the area with more homes, uh, businesses moving with the International Court of London and here east, a brand new cultural and education district, uh, and the park itself. Um, as the Mayor said, the uh, East London is the fastest growing area of the capital, 110,000 additional jobs created since the Games, um, and in Tower Hamlets there are now 50,000 more jobs, since new jobs since 2012, um, with Newham and Hackney both seeing <coughs> job growth five times larger than expected. Um, the legacy is about the long term. The work that the LLDC does is about changing the lives of the people in the area, which is not going to happen overnight. More widely, the concept of the uh, of a, of a mayoral de development corporation has been a real success. It's a credit to London. It's a credit to all of the people involved, and it's looked on, as I know from uh, uh, the other uh, work that I do, uh, nationally and internationally, as a success story. Um, and we should all be very proud of it. Um, and you can see elsewhere, South Tees has launched a development corporation, but you can see elsewhere um, people trying to emulate the success of this um, mechanism. Um, that's it. That's all I want to say. David? Thank you. Um, so <coughs> maybe I can just put a bit more flesh on why we do believe we are really delivering uh, now, uh, delivering on the promises that there were before the Olympic Games of 2012 to transform the area for uh, local people. Um, these things aren't easy. Uh, I think it probably is the largest uh, regeneration scheme in Europe. Uh, it's a very challenging thing to deliver. Um, but uh, at the event that uh, Sir Peter just referred to, the, the previous uh, chance with Exchequer described it as the most successful regeneration project in Europe. Um, and to be a bit more specific about what the components of that and why we are delivering now and those benefits are being seen now, not just uh, promises for the future. Uh, the major employers coming into the area are a really important part of that in creating a new, a new business district. Within Here East now, we've got world-class employers uh, in tech, in education, in cultural organisations, such as UCL bringing their robotics, uh, Ford bringing their smart mobility innovation centre, BT Sport, Wayne McGregor's Random Dance and others. And at the international quarter, as well as TfL and FCA, who are now actually moving in, uh, those uh, long anticipated moves, but future tenants such as uh, Cancer Research UK and the British Council. So we are really uh, seeing a business district uh, coming uh, to life in the area, and we do a lot of work with all the new employers coming in to make sure that the benefits of that do cascade through to local people. Uh, just on the park and venues uh, themselves, the employers there we work very closely with, and over two-thirds of all the jobs, the long-term permanent jobs in those, uh, those locations have gone to local people. The park and venues are becoming a major destination now. Uh, that is happening now. We've had over 18 million visitors in the three and a half years since the park reopened. Um, we're running at over 6 million a year now. And the Aquatic Centre, just to choose one venue, uh, over 3 million visitors since it reopened, with many thousands of children learning to swim there each week. So, again, those benefits are being felt for local people uh, now. 
Um, I'm sure we'll come back uh, to issues on the uh, Olympic Stadium, um, but it's already proved itself a fantastic venue for multiple uh, different types of events, a multi-use venue uh, that is world-class in the different events it hosts. We had great concerts uh, this summer for uh, sold-out concerts, almost a quarter of a million people. Um, we're now hosting West Ham matches as a matter of course with uh, you know, no significant issues. And of course this summer we hosted the fantastic uh, World Athletics and Power Athletics Championships uh, with millions of visitors and a global TV audience. And actually the significance of the stadium in the wider regeneration and the benefits we're delivering is in about the contribution it uh, makes to raising the profile of the area, uh, attracting businesses in, that global uh, uh, recognition that it helps create, and it is a very significant factor in our overall plans. <coughs> Housing is obviously crucial. Uh, we have our long-term plan will deliver uh, over 24,000 homes in the area, and in fact we are ahead of uh, track, ahead of schedule in delivering those. Um, the former Olympic Village, as you'll know, is, is now uh, pretty much fully occupied, it's over 97% occupancy with 3,000 new homes. Our first development since the Games at Chobham Manor, the first phase of that is approaching completion this autumn. Uh, we've brought forward the Eastwick and Sweetwater developments uh, over six years uh, and those will be starting on site in the, in the new year. Um, and again, what is crucial to what we're delivering in terms of building sustainable communities is that we're also delivering the community infrastructure that will support the housing. So for example, uh, now uh, three new schools open uh, on the park, uh, the third opened this September, and that's a very important part of that long-term building of sustainable communities. Thank so you. having had, can I do two sentences? Having had that summer's fantastic events, over four million people on the park, the Oxford Economics Report that was released in October shows over a quarter of a million more jobs that have been previously forecasted. I think it is clear the regeneration in the area is really delivering now. We're looking forward to the Culture and Education District as a fantastic addition to that. And I think the future is tremendously exciting, delivering on a programme that's in very good shape. Thank you. Um, if members have any specific questions about anything that comes out of uh, that, those two statements, uh, we will take those questions at the end of the session if you have any time left. Um, I want now to um, ask... Um, to call upon Assembly Member Bailey to put the first question and it's entitled LLDC Finances. Or if you answer the first question in the sure. name of um, Assembly sure. Member Bailey. Thank you. Um, <coughs> so I'll go back to the fact we are a development corporation and it's maybe worth just stressing for a moment um, in, this, in this environment that we are unlike I think uh, other GLA bodies uh, such as TfL and the, and, and the police and, and the fire service that you hold to account in the sense that they are, they are obviously long-term operational businesses. We are, by contrast, a development corporation where really the business model is about investment up front uh, to deliver long-term long -term benefits. And so moving towards a, um, a, a more stable financial footing is about realising the benefits long-term of the investment that's being made in the, in the early years. Um, there are challenges on, on both the capital, uh, reaching a stable footing is about both the capital and revenue side, um, but I think the, I, I'm taking the question to, move, to be referring to the revenue subsidy we receive through, through the GLA and through the budgeting process uh, that the Assembly scrutinises. And on that, it has always been a long-term aspiration to move to a more uh, sustainable uh, position where we, where we reduce the subsidy. We are doing that very successfully year on year uh, now, um, and over the last over the five years that are covered by current plans, we reduce the subsidy uh, we receive for our net expenditure, excluding uh, the cost of financing, uh, but from around uh, almost 26 million last year uh, to about 23 million this year, and they reduce further to 21 million next year, 20 million the year after and 16 in 2021. That is year-on-year year incremental reduction in subsidy as we increase our income and reduce our costs in the way I've said in this environment before and which has been our long-term uh, aim. We have actually over the last couple of years done better than the budgets. Um, our income has been higher and our expenditure lower and therefore the requirement has been, has been less uh, and we've been able to eat into uh, those uh, forecast subsidies somewhat more. So I think we are making good progress. It's always been a long-term aspiration. We haven't put a time frame on when we would reach a point where it might break even because it is a very long-term plan. But I think in terms of making good progress on reaching a more stable footing, we are doing exactly what we have previously said. 
Assemblymember Bailey. Um, thank you for that, but of course we would want to know when you expect to be financially stable, um, independent, because saying it's a long-term aspiration and giving us no bookend is, is slightly distressing. So could you give us a date, a range of dates and aspiration for when that might be the case? Well, maybe I can uh, explain a bit more why it's, why it's uh, challenging to do, give the, the very precise bookends you're, you're, you're asking for. Uh, the, the nature of the plans is we are investing in capital uh, in, and, and long term we generate revenue out of that. So partners coming onto the park pay us rents, they pay fixed estate charges and that will provide the revenue base that will make the, the operation of the park sustainable in the long term. We have got a number of challenges, some of which I'm sure we'll come on to in this, in this hearing, around the capital, which means a lot of those items are still being reviewed in terms of what the timing is uh, as they'll uh, come into fruition, and therefore what, what timing rent uh, revenue payments will start coming out of them. So we are, for example, looking at our housing plans, again in light of the Mayor's uh, policies and commitments on seeking more affordable housing more quickly. We've got challenges around the stadium. We've had to rework the plans around the culture and education district. I, and as, I, as sorry, firm up those plans, sorry, just to interrupt. I, I understand all that, but do you have some kind of goal? You, you have all these different things that you, you need to work on, and I accept that. Yeah. But you must have in your own planning some goal that you're aiming for, some point where you would be close to financial independence. You must have that because we would want to know that. Because again, Londoners are funding this and would want some kind of indication when that may end. Well, I understand that if there was a specific specific date, you'd want to know that, but I'm, I'm sorry to tell you that actually there isn't such a date. We've always said... Uh, so you I've have no it, working assumptions? We, we, well, the, the, to set a target, I think, of the sort you're describing, I think would be artificial. We'd be saying, here's, here's a notional date. What we're trying to do, day in, day out, is make sure we drive down our costs and we increase our revenues in the way I've described, so that the subsidy we require from the GLA is reduced, and we've done that successfully to the order of about a £9 million per annum reduction on, on 25 million, so a very significant reduction over the five years I, I described. Uh, but there isn't a point where we've said that's when we've got to break even. It is of the nature of the, of the, of the business of a development corporation that, that there is upfront investment to support the long-term benefits. But as P Peter said in his opening statement, the benefits are all about the very long term. We're trying to tackle, I think, in, in East London, very deep-rooted uh, socio and economic uh, challenges and they will take time to, to address. We're investing in, in housing, in culture, in universities, in education priorities um, and, and I can't put a time frame when the business will operationally be self-financing. Is, is there a danger that LLCC then, because it doesn't have this idea of when it will be self-sustaining, will, will not deliver the legacy we're looking for? What, what, what are the challenges that, that are so Mercurial that you can't give us some kind of bookend of when this might end. Um, I, th I think the challenges are very specific. I, did you say mercurial? Yeah, yeah. I don't think they're mercurial. I think they're quite specific, and, and we know what they are. Um, they're, they're, uh, they're, there are challenges around uh, shaping our future housing programme. So we've made good progress already uh, with some of our early housing schemes. Uh, but they were, I suppose, delivered under the previous mayor's, or developed and, and, and started delivery under the previous mayor's policy. We've been uh, started reviewing those in the light of last year's mayoral election and looking at how can we recognise the priority there is now for more affordable housing more quickly and reshape those plans. There are challenges which, again, as I said, I'm sure we'll come back to in relation to the uh, Olympic Stadium, which we're uh, still working on and will take some time to work through. And we've got a very, very major investment in bringing world-class uh, universities, world-class cultural partners to the heart of the East End. It's a very large and complex scheme, um, and it has had to be shaped, reshaped because of some of the planning issues there were in relation to the tall towers that were helping to finance that scheme. And as we work through all of those things, those are the specific challenges that mean it's hard for us to lock down a capital plan at the moment. We are working closely with the GLA and our board on that. Uh, and the revenue consequences flow out of it. So, I, I mean, that, that is as clear as I can be about the, the challenges. The Mayor has suggested that the LLDC could be wrapped up in five years. Are you working on that assumption? Um, I think he said it would be an issue for the second term rather than that it would be a specific time frame such as five years. Uh, obviously, we're working closely uh, with the Mayor on, on our future plans. Um, I think the Mayor said when he wrote the local uh, borough leaders and mayors that this was something that we would want to address. He actually asked Sir Peter to pick that up in, uh, as part of his new appointment. But the, 
tone of the message was that there's been a very successful regeneration being delivered by, uh, by LLDC. He wants to, that sustained and taken further. Uh, but there is work to do about looking at the model for, for what a succession body might look like. There's a real priority to make sure those financial issues I've referred to have been addressed. Uh, and that is work that I think Sir Peter will be taking forward with the uh, with uh, colleagues in City Hall, Jules Pipe as the Deputy Mayor and David Bellamy as the uh, Chief of Staff, but with the four local boroughs in whose areas we sit with their uh, leaders and mayors. Starting, so, starting in, the, in, in uh, the early period of next year. Uh, I, so, um, Sir Peter, so are you, are you happy with the fact that we don't seem to be working towards a date when, when we can call success and we can say that this is this has happened we we are running sustainably now because the worry is you have the backstop of us continually subsidizing you so it may not be focusing as hard as you can on ending the ongoing bill look i suppose i should say I, you know, i'm an accountant by background the financial things are my, where i sort of start from but in this organization it is not only about I, I wouldn't define success only about financial sustainability we've been set up as a as the first development corporation to deliver a regeneration programme. And I think we define success, first of all, about whether we're achieving that. It is about whether we're bringing the new jobs, creating the employment, helping local people be well, best place to get those jobs, whether we deliver the housing, we create world-class new employers such as universities and cultural partners, is a very big part of our definition of success, alongside and parallel to having to be financially sustainable. And we have to achieve both, and those are, I think, um, success comes over time as we as we successfully see that regeneration come in place and have a long-term financial plan that's sustainable and the only thing i'd add is that is that this is a this is a very substantial undertaking and you would expect uh, things of national and international significance like brexit its effect on house price inflation and labor supply over time to affect how the financial fortunes of ldc um, pan out and, and and they will and they are is there any ever significant thing that's affecting your, the plans you're, ma you're making? And can you give me an idea of something specifically you're doing to drive down your revenue costs? So, uh, so yeah. to drive up your revenue income, rather. Well, so I can give you examples of the sorts of things we've been doing over the last couple of years to do exactly that. Um, so uh, we've delivered, over the last three years, over £24 million pounds of uh, savings and efficiencies identified in our uh, budgets that are... Uh, uh, part of your uh, scrutiny uh, exercise. Um, so that's included uh, reductions in some of our, uh, uh, our core programmes, but a lot of it is about driving better value out of our contractors. So uh, on, the, on the park, we have a very large contract with uh, NG Facilities Management. We're driving out £3.5 million pounds per annum uh, savings out of that from just getting that done more, efficiency, uh, more efficiently and challenging their working arrangements, the scope, and making sure we get best value from that. We've had a very successful uh, programme of work over the last uh, two to three years, I'd say, since the, uh, since the Aquatic Centre and the Copper Box opened to look at their running costs. Obviously, they were unique venues when they, when they opened in 2014. Um, and so, we, you know, learning from that and looking at how we can challenge, for example, uh, the utilities uh, costs, the usage of utilities and the way that's uh, managed in the Aquatic Centre has been a really major challenge we've, we've done a lot of work on over the last two years and that's driven down the subsidy that's required very significantly. Uh, we've been looking at uh, other bills, you know, rates and others to, to get better value uh, across the piece. And the subsidies for uh, the venues have come down very significantly at uh, both the Aquatic Centre and the Copper Box and we've turned both the uh, Three Mills uh, uh, Studios business and the, uh, the uh, Orbit operation from requiring uh, subsidy as they were in deficit to now generating surpluses which contribute to our uh, improved position. So on all of those venues we've moved, either dramatically reduced the subsidy required or changed it to making a surplus. Okay. What significant advancement have you made on dealing with a stadium because that's an onerous cost according to, to the, the, the papers we have. What significant advance have you made on dealing with that? Sorry, what significant... Advance, what plans do you have to deal yeah. with the onerous cost, as you yeah. as it says in the papers, about the cost of running the stadium? Yeah, so um, there are significant challenges, and I think I've said this in various uh, committees and uh, probably in this forum uh, before, around managing the stadium. Um, I suppose they, they break down into three or four main categories. Uh, I can say a bit about what we're doing uh, on each. 
Um, there is a challenge around the uh, seating system that's installed uh, and the costs and time of moving it. Uh, there's challenges around the sort of day-to-day -day operation uh, with, with, uh, on match days and other event days. Uh, the, the structure is quite complex, uh, and I'll say a bit more as I say about each of these. And because of the structure, I think we get less value from, from commercial rights than we could uh, otherwise. So um, I would say all those challenges are in the, in the context of a stadium that is, as I said in my opening words, a big part. We, we, we see it absolutely as fundamental to the uh, transformational benefit that's being delivered and the economic value that's being derived in the area because it does help raise the profile and bring all those uh, millions of people into, into the park in the area, which creates economic activity and raises the profile. But we are tackling each of those issues specifically. Uh, on the seating, we've got uh, specialist engineers in looking at um, alternative ways we might configure the seating uh, we've got there to reduce cost and time of, of moves, and that will uh, may require some, some initial investment to produce long-term savings over the long term. But actually, we've already found incremental changes we can make. So, for example, for, um, for next summer's athletics, we've looked at a different configuration where we don't need to move the seats all the way back. We can do if you like, partial changes to each of the uh, stands, and it dramatically reduces the cost of, of seat moves. So those sort, that sort of very detailed work in the granular detail of, um, of, of the what's driving the costs and how we can reduce it is going on on the seating side. On match days, we're looking at um, reducing the cost of stewarding, for example, so managing crowds from the stadium, out of the stadium, through the park and into the stations um, is, is a significant challenge. I feel it's a, a symptom of success because Stratford has become so uh, busy and popular that the station is, is very crowded, the park is very crowded, uh, but that means we have to uh, spend significant money on managing the crowds. But we're looking at simplifying those egress routes, making them uh, move, move more uh, smoothly and, and less uh, interface with crowds coming out of Westfield uh, so that we can reduce stewarding costs. Uh, we're looking at uh, all of the contracts, we're looking at all the agreements that are in place and making sure we can maximise the benefit out of them, both in terms of uh, opportunities for, for further revenue and, uh, uh, and, and, and minimising costs. The ownership structure is being looked at, and I think I've said before that there's been discussions with, uh, between the Mayor of London and the Mayor of Newham around that, but it is having a joint venture ownership uh, and a joint venture body uh, is complicated uh, with then uh, an, an arm's length operator working contractually with, with the concessionaires, and we will look at that structure uh, and see how we can make that more efficient, and I think there will be decisions made on that in the near future. Um, but that structure does also mean that the rights are split, so we don't have the opportunity, as some other stadia do, to sell combined rights around, for example, the, the club and the venue and the secondary rights. They're, they're, the ownership at the moment, moment is split. So again, we're looking at can we make that simple, more simplified to, to get better value. So I'm sorry that's a long answer, but, but if you're asking across the range of challenges, uh, on, on, on the stadium that came behind that, uh, that, that, that figure. That's then fine, thank you. C can I just ask something? There's a £200 million pound loss that's um, put, put in your accounts as a, an accounting convention. Could you give me some clarity on that? Uh, is there any point we will be e we're expected to contribute to fill that gap, or, or is it just a, yeah. a so, line in, in the account? So for, I think two things to say on that. First of all, that the that, that entry is the... It's a current year provision of what future years long-term losses might be. Um, not, so it's not a current loss, it's not, not a loss that's being incurred now. It's a, it's a projection that we have to make a provision in the accounts for, uh, for future losses, it, uh, effectively if we didn't fix uh, the, the, the business of the stadium. Whereas in fact, of course, all the things it's I've just explained to you are, are the steps we're taking to fix it. So it's not a current year loss, it's a projection of what losses would might be if those contracts all carried on uh, without how would that fixed. loss be covered if it happened? So, well, I think the point is it won't be. We're fixing yeah, it. But, but so but let's just, just imagine for a minute things don't go your way. How would that loss be covered? Well, um, it, it would be a loss that the business would incur year on year over the very long term. We have 99-year uh, concession agreements with West Ham. So if nothing was done to fix it, um, it would be a loss that would be incurred annually. And the money but, would but be I think that is, I think, I think, sorry, I think it's important to say Nobody is working on that basis. We are working to fix it so that the loss is dramatically less. We are look, working to make sure that the stadium contributes to the economic value of the regeneration in the area that's being delivered. And I would also like to say that I, the, the, it, it was never in, we never planned or anticipated the stadium making a significant uh, surplus into our, uh, into our financial position. 
the aspiration was that it would contribute to the legacy, and we, we want to get it to a, to a position where it breaks even, where it's not a, a drain on resources. And all the measures I've described are the ones we're taking to try and get I, it into I, that I accept, place. I accept the measures, and I, I desperately want it to succeed. We, we all do. But obviously, we have to be cognizant of the fact that you have put £200 million loss in here. At some point, that may need to be covered. Is, would that cover come from the GLA? I, I think I've said there is... The pro that is not going to occur because all again, the measures... Again, if, I, I, if, if, why is it in the provision? Why, why, why is it in the then? And, 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 and again, well, because, I really because, the, because the accounting requirement is that we, we recognise in our accounts the future, where we have contracts that are, that are onerous, which means they are a burden on the organisation, which yes, at the moment they that. are, that we recognise the future value, the future losses of those contracts um, as if uh, on, on the current information. And at the time we prepared our accounts, that, that was the information we had. I, I don't because, want to label the point because I because think the measures, because, so I do want to say, because the measures we are taking couldn't be recognised in therefore in reducing that. And, and that I accept the measures, and, and I, I wish you every success with the measures, you'd just be cognizant that bill will be coming somewhere, to my mind, here, so we'd, we'd like to know. One, one, other, one other small, maybe a small point, is the naming rights for the stadium. It would suggest that nobody's pursuing that. I, could you give us an update? Is somebody pursuing the naming rights? Is, is there... Is there someone waiting in the wings? Yes. You're courting? Uh, of course. Um, I, I, I don't want you to leave with the impression that you are going to fund that whole owner's contract provision, but I will we'll move okay, on. Okay, thank so you. So in relation to uh, naming rights, um, because of the uh, work that we are uh, doing now in relation to looking at the future of the stadium, we aren't actively pursuing uh, a naming rights partner. Um, we have um, had uh, a lot of interest in, in the past. You will know uh, there have been media reports which... Uh, reflect some of the interest that has been in the past. Um, I think it's worth saying again that you know, the stadium has been open operationally for just over a year. Um, we had, uh, you know, it, it opened for the start of the 16-17 football season. Um, it's not unusual where new uh, venues are looking for naming rights partners for, for that to be an exercise that does take a considerable time. So I'm not unduly concerned by the fact that just over a year after the stadium opening it hasn't got a naming rights partner. Um, but whilst the work that's going on under the Mayor's review uh, the Mayor announced that review also around a year ago, um, that, that we're not actively marketing the, the venue. We have, I should say, had a significant amount of uh, un, uh, prompted and un, uh, 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 well, unprompted interest from potential uh, sponsors uh, since the summer's events. I think the global profile that the World Athletics had and the uh, images of the stadium that were projected uh, did create a resurgence of interest in it, and we've had a number of, I can say, informal conversations of initial interest that were unprompted by our by our marketing. But um, so so we will come back to that, I think, once once the outcomes from the mayor's review are clear. Thank you. Did, did you say earlier on that, that the the mayor and E20 are looking at a different ownership model for the, for the stadium? Uh, I said that the ownership model was part of what's being looked at uh, in in terms of how the uh, future of the stadium is resolved. Yes. Do you see that as any problem looking for naming rights? Is that going to add a significant co cost? Uh, no, I think the, the ownership, so the ownership is currently split, uh, it, well, it's a joint ownership between ourselves at LLDC with the London Borough of Newham. So the joint venture that we refer to in, in uh, much of our papers, E20, is a joint venture body between, it's a, um, a limited uh, liability partnership between LLDC and Newham. Um, that means both we and Newham are involved and E20 itself as a separate entity. Mm. Uh, it then has a contract with the operator <coughs> and then there are the relationships with the concessionaires. So what I was referring to was, I think with the benefit of hindsight as we look here now, that structure looks, looks un unduly complex and yeah. maybe somewhat yeah. unwieldy. Uh, it's difficult for uh, the partners to be clear who's, where the responsibility is like and I think it, it wants simplifying. And I think saying that um, is something that Amongst all the parties, we, we agree, and this is being discussed, how that will happen. Just, just one last question. Should the LLDC be, be folded up? Should it be time limited? What, what would be the loss? What, what would we lose as Londoners if, if you were to be folded? Uh, what London would lose um, if LLDC was uh, more time limited than uh, currently planned is the, is the billions of pounds of economic value that's being created by uh, the investment we're delivering. Um, <coughs> the business case that... Uh, for the culture and education district alone uh, that's, that's been considered uh, and, and firming up our funding for that, it anticipates billions of pounds of economic value just from the fact we will, for example, be bringing world -class, two world-class universities 
it joining uh, a university, a world-class university, already on the park, so there'll be three world-class uh, cultural partners coming to the park. Uh, the 24,000 homes will be uh, developed in our area. Uh, the park, as a, as a visitor destination, that uh, 6 million people plus a year are enjoying, uh, I think London would lose an enormous amount. Uh, and the future, the long-term value of all that investment, I think would be an enormous loss. But it is a choice if some, that's what somebody wants to decide. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I have five members with follow-up questions. I'll start with Assemblymember Desai. Uh, David, I note your answers to Assembly Members um, Bailey's um, questions about the financial sustainability of the stadium. Uh, so I won't repeat his questions, but just to be very specific and much more direct than, assembly, than may I suggest Assembly Member Bailey was. You talked about the stadium moving to about uh, LLDC moving to a stable financial footing. You talked about long-term aspirations. You talked about uh, making good progress. But you are not in a position today to tell us that when uh, when will the LLDC have enough financial stability to be wound down? Yes or no? Uh, I, I, the, the question. There are two parts to the question because no. there is both a financial and there is a decision about winding down. Those are not. Those I'm are not necessarily the same I'm thing. by time. David. Sorry to interrupt. Our time constraints are not all the answers to Assembly Member Bailey's questions. So my question is very direct. You are not in a position today to tell us about um, when you will be in a position to actually be wound down. Uh, the decision about when LLDC is wound down is a decision that the Mayor will make in consultation with borough leaders and, uh, and Peter as the chair of LLDC, looking at when is the right time okay. to stop having an organisation. But it, it, the financial factors are a, very, a significant part of that, but not the only factors, because there is the benefit that's being delivered I, and deciding it's the right time sorry, that you don't want a development corporation right, and, for the And area. we need to do some work first. Sorry? And we need to do some work first on a plan to okay. wind it down. Just Moving on very quickly to the issue of naming rights, again, I note your answers to Assemblymember uh, Bailey's questions. I asked you about this, David, back in January, and in opening statement today, you talked in glowing terms about the stadium, um, all the successes, and so on. But in January, at budget and performance, from memory, you said you're confident, in fact, you're very confident about securing uh, a deal with, with, a, with, yep. a, with a sponsor. We are now coming towards the end of 2017. Are you still that confident? Uh, yes, uh, I, I, I think uh, absolutely confident that in time, uh, selling naming rights for a stadium, this is a multi-million pound and multi-year commitment for a partner, and I think the I, process of finding a partner that is aligned in terms of its objectives and aspirations and wants to be associated with the stadium, and the stadium suitable, is, is a situation that often takes time. I'm absolutely confident it will happen uh, in the future, confident. but again, it's, it's difficult to put a time scale when the right partner comes forward with the right commitment. I'm, but sure, I'm the, sure we'll come the, back to this topic again. I know that you're extremely confident now and then. The, I think the end of October. But with so. the fact we have got a mayoral review going on on the stadium does mean we are not actively marketing it in the way sure. we would otherwise at the moment. Um, if I can just go into some specific issues, um, uh, Peter and David. Um, when will the LLDC be in a position to return planning powers to the five boroughs? In May 2017, I believe the five boroughs, the leaders of the five boroughs wrote to you requesting a start of discussions, wrote to the mayor requesting a start of discussions around returning planning powers. So when do you think will be in a position to return planning powers and what would be the risk and benefits of returning these powers to the boroughs? So um, I can't say yet because I haven't been there long. Uh, when the mayor appointed me, he asked me to uh, work on plans to look at uh, the long-term future of the Park and the LLDC. Part of that <coughs> is indeed to look at the uh, return of the planning powers. So we'll start that work uh, early next year and we'll see where it, where it takes us. In the meantime, actually developing out the park in the, in the way that it's been planned already has proved to be a great success so far. Uh, and I can't see any reason why we shouldn't carry on doing that until we find some other methodology of, 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 of proceeding. I think, I think in, in doing that work, it will have to be considered that there is benefit at the moment from the planning powers being with the development powers. That was the logic that was applied when the development corporation was set up, to have those combined powers to enable regeneration to happen in an accelerated way and with one point of contact for developers, for applicants uh, and for, and for uh, boroughs and, and all the uh, partner organisations we work with. So the question I think will be partly about when's the right time where you can actually lose the benefit of be being together um, will, will be a consideration in that. Because at the moment, whilst we're still developing 
For example, the, you know, the Cultural and Education District planning applications will be going on uh, over the next two to three years, um, and, and uh, you know, as they go through uh, initial planning and then and then detail. So, the, the, there is a challenge around the right time to yeah. break up something that has worked in the way it has over the last few years. Um, okay, um, just a minute, member. Uh, we have got a second question on the future of the LLDC. So, can I take you back to finances for your yeah, okay, fine. Uh, is enough. the rest of your questions? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, well, talking specifically about finances, there seems to be a lot of focus on the fixed estate charge to repay your mm -hmm. debts. Uh, what are the risks around this? Um, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. The fixed estate charge is a very important part of the long-term plan, um, and the idea is that it is a um, a charge that incoming uh, tenants and partners pay to be part of the park and the wider development and enjoying uh, the whole estate that, that has been created. Um, there's, uh, I think, little. It is now consumed into a mayoral direction, uh, so it has a, a sort of a legal basis. Uh, I think there's, uh, we have started applying it to the tenants uh, who are on the park. So I think um, the principle and the practice are well established. So I don't see particular risk in, in those respects. The risk we're uh, facing over the next few years as we move towards a more financially sustainable position is about the pace of development and therefore the pace by which uh, developments get completed and charges start getting levied and that's, that's the uncertainty I referred to earlier. But basically once developments are completed the charge flows and will go into our income. Thank you Chair. Thank you. Assembly Member Shaw. Uh, thank you Chair. Uh, David, uh, this morning in your presentation, you mentioned referring to Olympic Park and particularly the venues mm. that uh, uh, there, there is uh, that they're becoming a major destination. That's good news, and uh, I welcome that. Uh, leaving aside the stadium, can you tell the assembly what is the medium and long-term financial viability of the venues uh, within the park? Uh, yeah. So. Um I mean, I suppose there were four main venues we manage. Um, the uh, uh, the uh, aquatic centre um, and the copper box we manage under one contract. Um, and the challenge there has been since they reopened in uh, 2014, uh, having been closed uh, for transformation after the games, uh, has been to um, move them to a much more sustainable footing. Uh, I should say that the um, visitor numbers for both venues have been uh, have been fantastic. Uh, and I think maybe greater than uh, anyone anticipated before. So uh, the Copper Box, in uh, about four years since it reopened, has had uh, about 1.7 million uh, visitors. Uh, the Aquatic Centre, um, in the same period, uh, over, over 3 million, or in fact in, in a shorter period, about three and a half years, over 3 million visitors. Um, and we do, in relation to the financial position, we do price these venues. Uh, we price usage, all the swims at the Aquatic Centre, the usage, etc., of the Copper Box to be comparable to other local venues uh, in, in the host borough areas, not to maximise the income. And that is really so that we are, again, respecting the uh, commitments of the legacy, that we would make these uh, facilities accessible to local people and that the local people are, in fact, the predominant uh, users. So um, on the financial uh, position, as you described, um, the Aquatic Centre, we have uh, reduced the operating uh, subsidy or the deficit it generates on its operations very significantly from the initial years. Uh, some of that is uh, through the measures I referred to earlier in relation to uh, really intensive work about making the utilities uh, operation more efficient. Uh, we've reduced the rates bill. We challenge all the time the operating costs uh, there, and the, the operating uh, subsidy required has reduced significantly. Uh, on the copper box, it is now operating on its sort of uh, routine day-to-day -day operations. It makes a small surplus, so it is uh, moved into that position, which is very welcome. Um, uh, but again, there's, there's uh, challenges we're looking at around the uh, wider building management and estate management and how we reduce those. On the uh, orbit and on three mills, we've been able to turn what were venues requiring a uh, subsidy into ones that now make a surplus and contribute to our finances. So uh, on the orbit, the introduction of the slide about uh, 18 months ago uh, has turned that from a venue that did require uh, a deficit, about £600,000 in 2015-16, to one that made uh, a small surplus last year and a much larger surplus this year, around half a million. So we're getting to the point where uh, actually those surpluses are, uh, are, are reaching the point greater than the deficits were previously, 
uh, as we've turned that around. So I'm very pleased about that. And on Three Mills, uh, which is a very significant uh, studio operation for London, uh, again, date, sort of the annual operation has been uh, in a surplus for the last uh, couple of years, uh, having previously again been uh, making a loss, and we've worked hard with the uh, venue operator there to make sure that that is uh, making a contribution to our finances. I should say long term, which was your question, uh, if Three Mills is to continue operating in its current mode, it will need significant further investment. Uh, and it hadn't originally been our plans that we should maintain long-term ownership and that therefore we should uh, make that investment, but that is a discussion we're having. But we're not the freeholder. We, we have a lease on, on three mills. Uh, there is a question about its future. So uh, if it is to carry on generating the uh, annual surpluses it has contributed for the last couple of years, it will need further investment. D David, in the long term, uh, can you tell us whether uh, both uh, Copper Box as well as Aquatic Centre will continue to remain uh, financially uh, sustainable as well as affordable to the local residents and communities? Um, so, I mean, that, that is the challenge, as you say, because keeping them affordable to uh, the local residents has been our priority and the pricing has reflected that. Um, they are, I think, in their own right, world-class venues. Um, very few uh, swimming facilities, I think, have anything like the scale and uh, span and, and the footprint of, of the aquatic centre. So what, what I can say is that we are continuing to bring down the cost to challenge the, the cost of running it. Um, but it would be an unusual, I think, an unusual swimming facility in London that didn't need some sort of subsidy. And this is on a, on a fantastic scale. It's a world-class facility. Um, but it is, I suppose, supporting the venues as part of the park, as part of the envi environment we've created, is part of what the fixed estate charge will long-term uh, help LLDC and its successor organisations to do because it will enable us to keep that whole uh, state uh, together and provide that financial resource. Thank you very much. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Assemblymember Duval. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Chair, I think uh, David was very correct in not giving us a date of when um, uh, LDDC would be uh, balancing the books, but I can go back to a previous chair back in 2000 and. 14, in answer to uh, Assemblymember Boff's question, the then chair said, to the, well, I should say the then chair was Boris Johnson, who said that, um, that they, the aim to be self-financing was 2017 stroke 18, and this was a considerable achievement. But the reason why I want to quote him a little bit further, because I want to drill down on the stadium. I know that we are going to come to this later, I do not want to anticipate the question, but the deal that we've done in the stadium will actually mean, unlike virtually any other Olympic stadium I can think of around the world, there will be no extra revenue funding going into the stadium. So I want to talk about the challenge, I think the key challenge that you're facing at the moment that must be where you're losing sleep is around the stadium and its finances and some of the issues that have arisen. And I was very interested to see in some uh, research around some of the legal costs that had been incurred since 2013, which I think is acceptable, but by any stretch of the imagination, are rather on the high side of around three and a half million. And I was particularly keen to see the cost incurred by E20 and between E20 and West Ham. I wasn't clear who was challenging who in those legal arrangements, and maybe you could shed some light on that. Um, but it does say uh, around some of the contract issues, uh, which I want to go on further in terms, in terms of the other contracts, there's a particular problem. Do you want to comment on those legal costs as where you see those, and particularly E20? And I'll ask you to talk about E20 because let, let's cut through the crap, really. E20 is really an only owned subsidiary. It might be a joint venture between you, uh, Newham and yourself, but we are funding it. You, LDDC, GLA, with the mayor's uh, bank roll at the back of you. So can we just, can you throw some, shed some light on that? Who's doing what to <coughs> whom? Yes, of course. And where and why? Um, so I think, first of all, just on E20, just factually, it's not an LLDC subsidiary, it is a joint venture. It is established as a joint venture, jointly owned by LLDC and Newham. So um, I think, if you don't mind, just to correct that, 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 that would be a wrong uh, uh, understanding to leave on the record. Uh, but to go to your point, the um, legal fees you referred to um, have been, uh, and I 
I think the figures you refer to actually are both from E20 and LLDC, so to, that's not, we don't need to labour on the uh, distinction. Um, they were from uh, the period from uh, 2013, so they did include uh, the early years negotiations with the original agreements, so the agreement, the West Ham concession, the UK Athletics concession and the operator agreement, as well as uh, issues that we've had since uh, the stadium opened. So they included all those, the negotiation of them, and as, as is well known, there was significant legal challenges to those. So the costs that have been incurred by LLDC and E20, uh, that, that uh, three and a half million figure that, that we'd released, was, uh, was a combination of those early years, costs of originally negotiating the agreements and, uh, and the disputes around those, and some more recent uh, challenges, which I think is where you're uh, focusing. I think in relation to uh, more recent costs uh, that we've spent on, on legal advisors, um, I think the first thing I'd say, I think, you know, from my point of view, um, accountable for our uh, spend on, on these sorts of matters and accountable for the public money we, we do spend, we always make sure we've got, we don't go into any uh, legal expenditure without having strong legal advice uh, on, our, on our case uh, and that actually we are, taking, uh, we, we are taking legal steps where we are defending uh, the public person, defending up the public money. Um, so so all, our, uh, all our expenditure is, is predicated on that. Um, we have had uh, some legal challenges since, uh, since the stadium became fully operational with West Ham moving in uh, last year. Uh, and we've had issues where uh, we've had strong legal advice that we should uh, defend uh, E20's rights and entitlements under that uh, concession agreement. Um, I would say, again, in the spirit that we, um, we are very careful about making those sorts of commitments and very mindful of, uh, not of, of the public money we're spending, is that we don't quickly go to uh, legal action uh, or to, to legal proceedings. Uh, we seek negotiated agreements wherever we can, and there are a number of issues uh, where we have reached um, a negotiated settlement where we could satisfy ourselves we were getting good value and an appropriate uh, uh, value for the public purse from agreements with West Ham and uh, there's, there's some of the signage inside the stadium, the pitch side sign, signage, the fan installation which I think you'll be familiar with, uh, where we've negotiated those sorts of, of agreements um, where we've, we've defended our rights if you like but being able to reach a negotiated settlement uh, with, with West Ham. But where we do have strong legal advice on our rights under the, under the concession agreement that we need to defend those rights and in doing so our, our, our public value then we have uh, used uh, legal advice uh, on those. I think you asked about the genesis of those uh, proceedings. I can say to you that all the proceedings, all the legal proceedings we're involved in, uh, have been instigated by West Ham. Uh, all of them are, we are, if you like, the defendant uh, protecting our interests. We haven't instigated any of them. So uh, that, that's the position. But we are defending them where we had strong legal advice, that we are protecting the rights uh, and entitlements that we have under the concession agreement. Okay. Can we move on to some of the other contracts? I mean, it might include West Ham. I think in one of the LDDC documents, it might be in your annual report, you talk about onerous contracts. Yeah. So are, are the onerous contracts that we're referring to are the agreements with tenants such as West Ham and the Athletics, um, but also you've got other contracts on catering as well as the E20 management. Uh, their, their contract, you don't call them, there's a probably a technical yeah, yeah. term, as a lay person is, what? what? I, I think I think uh, the I might need to check. I th so the we, we have three main agreements in, in E20. There's the two concessions, uh, the one with West Ham and the one with UK Athletics, uh, and there is an agreement with uh, the operator uh, that is to manage and operate the stadium and to bring in uh, events and generate uh, activity and, and usage of the stadium. So so that's quite different to the two concessions. Um, I'm, 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 I might need to check and confirm to you, but I'm, I'm almost completely confident that the owner's contracts provision relates to, if you, have, if you like, the costs that arise from the two concession agreements. Uh, part of having both means uh, that you would quite involve the seat moves to, to change the configuration of the stadium. Um, so I think I, I referred earlier in, to, to, to the question to Assembly uh, Member uh, Prince about the, um, when we talk about the challenges, that there's um, you know, the seats are a significant uh, challenge themselves. Uh, match day costs and, and operating uh, is a significant uh, cost. And effectively, the owner's contracts provision recognises the long-term value uh, of operating both concessions 
Um, on the, uh, I suppose it's worth saying on the UK Athletics Agreement that E20 doesn't, uh, other than very small parts of the catering, basically doesn't get any income. It's a, it's a uh, facility where the uh, UK Athletics come in and use to have the rights to the stadium for a month uh, and the income accrues to UK Athletics. Um, and we have uh, challenges, as, as I think you'll know and we've talked about before, around operating uh, the stadium for West Ham match days, which means that, may, that those contracts in aggregate uh, are onerous. Uh, we make a loss across the piece and the provision that was made was the long-term value of those. I was quite surprised about the two contracts relating to the management of the stadium and the catering arrangements. And I tried to look very carefully at those two organisations of what profit they were making out of their operations in the stadium. I kid you not, I'd like that you comment on it, why, why would we have a form of contracts where almost we are, it's legal, but we are endorsing legal tax avoidance? Because the profits they make here in terms of the stadium, they're registering as nil. That can't be right, is it? Are we making any money out of, um, not so much of the management sure of the stadium, but out of the catering issues? Is, is, is E20 making any money at all about any other events? You've explained about athletics. Tell us about the other arrangements that they have for other events in that stadium. So we have a contract with, um, with an operator. Uh, so it's only, from E20's point of view, it's one contract with an operator. It has subcontractors who provide, for example, the facilities management and, and the catering and um, you know, manage the pitch and all those sorts of, uh, and the building maintenance, all the various services that are required to operate the stadium and to bring in uh, future events, um, the we, we do we share in we we do uh, share in the income that comes from uh, catering uh, under that agreement. So uh, uh, we have I mean th those are actually reflected in the specific concession agreement uh, entitlements, but flow then through into the operator agreement. Uh, so we do we do to answer your question, we do get income from catering. We do share in that income, but it's a sharing under the various agreements. Um, the operator agreement is basically set up that we pay a fixed fee uh, related to uh, costs that are necessary for them to run the stadium and then there is a, um, a revenue sharing arrangement where the net costs of uh, operating the stadium is intended to generate net revenues and we uh, take a share and the operator keeps a share so that they are incentivised to generate them but we take most of the share of, uh, of surplus where there are not net operating revenues. So, for this assembly, just to be clear, we've got a problem with some of our major concessionaires and use of the stadium. We've got some problems around other contracts, and that at some stage, when more Stevens arrives with the report, and with some additional reports that you're doing, which you mentioned earlier to an earlier assembly <coughs> budgetary <coughs> meeting, yeah. we are going to have a coherent set of decisions. Are they your decisions, LDDC's decisions, or are they decisions that come out of this building? Um, the, so I mentioned earlier that part of the decisions will be about the future ownership, which will uh, help answer that question. Uh, certainly the scale of the challenge and the uh, issues we're dealing with, which you've described, are ones that where we, we are liaising very closely with uh, City Hall colleagues. Uh, the More Stevens Review is an important part of establishing, if you like, how we got here, uh, what, the, what the position is and, and why that was arrived at. And I think that will be an important part of informing the discussions about the future. Uh, and I think, you know, uh, this was discussed in the, in the recent Budget Committee, but there is frustration which uh, City Hall colleagues have expressed as well as, uh, as, well, as, well as us that that's, that's, you know, waited for uh, impatiently. Um, so, so there is a, a real desire to get that piece of the analysis, to get on with the various work streams we are in terms of how we can improve uh, the performance of the stadium and, as you say, effectively come to a coherent view about what's the best way of managing it forward. Um, I think it is inconceivable that any of those decisions would, would be made without uh, City Hall being fully involved because the financial exposure is so such that it's clearly a decision we would take working with uh, the Mayor and his team. And those decisions need to have been, we really need to have taken them actually a couple of months ago, we're still waiting, so I want to put, do you think we're going to be taking those crisp, uh, those decisions, you'll be setting those out, talking to City Hall uh, before Christmas? Uh, we've been, so I think uh, uh, David Bellamy wrote to uh, the Chair of the Budget Committee after the last hearing, saying that he, I think, uh, were, I think expecting to see, uh, or hoping or expecting to see uh, product from the Moore Stevens Review by the end of November. 
Um, I should say, so I think the conversation on that will happen before Christmas, but actually the conversations about what we're doing to improve the position, uh, the work on the seat system, the work on match day costs, the work on uh, rights, all those sorts of things is going on now anyway. It's not waiting, uh, but we're fully uh, involved in City Hall colleagues. But the information that the More Stevens review will give us and the context and the background that will help provide, uh, I expect to be discussing uh, around the end of the month when that report comes in. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I've got four more speakers, still on finances. Uh, Assemblymember Bacon. Yeah, um, I'll start by saying, to, to echo something you said earlier on, uh, David, and was echoed by Sir Peter, uh, Sir Peter um, as a regeneration project, uh, I think it has to be acknowledged that it's successful. Um, compared to any other uh, Olympic city uh, in the past, I think what's happened in London is transformationally better than anywhere else. That said, of course, there are some caveats to that. Uh, and the biggest running saw is the stadium. And I'm going to go back over a couple of the points that have been covered by the members just to try to get more, more detail. Firstly, the, when you were talking about the naming rights earlier on and the fact that you're not currently marketing on the naming rights, uh, you attributed it to two things. I think primarily it was around who really owns the stadium, so the, the, the ownership issue because of the joint venture, which I'll come on to in a moment. And secondly, you said that um, because of the mayoral review, you're not marketing the stadium uh, as you would have liked to, or words to that effect. I, I don't want to misquote you. On the joint venture, what is the balance of ownership between uh, the LLDC and Newham as part of the E20 umbrella? So E20 is 65% uh, LLDC, 35% Newham. Okay. So we are the majority owner. So if you were to proceed with a naming rights deal, would that mean that 65% of the revenue from that would come to the LLDC and 35 would go to Newham? Is that correct? Uh, in, in principle, so, so the, the uh, E20 is, is an entity, that, so it, it, it would receive the income. If E20 generates surpluses, then those would be distributed back to its members in, in membership shares, yes. Okay, is, I should say, I mean, just, I'm, I'm loath to add complexity on complexity. There isn't any, Newham's uh, in, initial investment went in with, with a, uh, an, um, an agreement about how that would be paid back out of surpluses, which meant they, they take some of that return first. Right. Does, would West Ham United get income from that as well? Um, so the uh, West Ham concession agreement provides that over a threshold of naming rights income, then West Ham would share. But the first... Okay, uh, provided it goes beyond a certain figure, West Ham would get a cut threshold. off the surplus rather than the overall... Correct. Okay, I understand that. Um, where are we at then? Because you've, I think, put great value on the fact that the um, ownership is being sorted out. Uh, there's a bit of a, a tangled web here and it needs to be sort of simplified before you can proceed with properly going for a naming rights deal. Is, have I understood that correctly? Uh, sorry, I, I wasn't meaning to imply that... I, th I think in relation to naming rights, I was uh, referring I, mainly, I think, to the fact there is the Mayor's Review looking at um, the, the stadium in, in so how we got here and the future, of which one strand is the ownership. And whilst that package of work is going on, uh, it didn't seem appropriate to be promoting the stadium to potential naming rights partners. Okay. So it's not only about the, name, the ownership, it's about the Mayor's review generally and looking at the future direction and how that's resolved before we have a proposition. I think, to, to, to apply the converse, I wouldn't want to be going out to the market saying, you know, come and market and name this uh, stadium for multi-million mm. pounds a year to major corporates yep. if there is un unresolved questions about its future I, I, uh, I completely operation. understand because we, we seem to have got into a very tangled web about who owns the stadium and, and who would get any income and, and everything else and I do entirely understand why you'd want to simplify it. Um, the difficulty though is that um, figures have been banded around um, the, apparently in the E20 profit and loss account uh, which I haven't had sight of so this is hearsay um, there's a figure included in that in the medium term profit and loss of four and a half million pounds per year income, projected income, uh, from a naming rights deal on the stadium, which would of course go some way uh, to making uh, the contractual arrangements yeah. less onerous, to use the, the accounting term. Um, that being so, the longer this goes on, the, the less income you are drawing down now, where there is a problem now. So when are you expecting the naming rights situation to be resolved, the ownership situation to be resolved, so you can then pursue a naming rights deal? Um, I, I think in the near future, I don't think that will be long. Um, I'm hoping that it will be, it will be you know, in the short term, as in weeks, months, not years at all. So uh, you in know, 2017? I think uh, I'd hope it to be resolved in this financial year. 
in this financial year. So we're yeah. looking at March the 31st, but quite, I mean, 2018. So I'm trying not, I don't want to, I think it will get announced when it's ready to be announced. It will be, it will be soon. Um, and soon. there's a lot of work going on to resolve that immediately. Okay. So once that's done, uh, and I don't doubt you that there is work going on, I know there is, um, will you be proceeding with marketing the stadium as soon as possible after that? Uh, I think once that's done and there is clarity on the future direction of which getting the outcome from the more Stevens work and decisions that we'd make uh, the future ownership uh, where that's sitting would make uh, about future direction then I think you'd be in a position to go back to the market but I think you would want greater clarity about the f all the issues I've referred to before that was taken forward. Yes I know and I, I appreciate the question I'm about to ask you now I feel on about to ask it but it is a how long is a piece of string question how long is that going to take? <laughs> I think you are to do it yourself. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's, that's the danger with pressing the isn't it? Um, the other thing that I want to pick up as well is the uh, issue of the seats and moving the seats. And uh, a comment you made earlier on uh, is that you found ways of dramatically reducing the cost of moving the seating. Um, from what to what? But the figure that we understand is the cost at the moment, or was the cost last summer, is £8 million, which is what's being looked at every year. Uh, is that a figure that you recognise? And if the reconfiguration that you've been looking at is dramatically reducing it, what's it now? settling at? Uh, it's a figure I recognise, yes. Um, I think the, we had particular challenges this summer because we were hosting uh, well not, opportunities and challenges. We were hosting the great, probably the biggest sports event that works in the world uh, this year uh, with the World Athletics. But as a, a sort of uh, estimate of what that would be to move all four stands in future years, uh, that, that's a number we recognise. Um, the, the largest single part of that, I think naturally four stands in a stadium, uh, the East Stand is much the largest and much the most uh, complex to move um, and uh, to illustrate the sort of opportunity we've identified when we hosted the 2016 Diamond League events, uh, we took some of the rows off the front of the East Stand and some moved some blocks but we didn't move the stand and that dramatically reduces uh, the cost um, and so uh, the opportunity to do that sort of arrangement in future mm -hmm. would bring down the cost very significantly. Uh, we're then looking in the same way at the other stands and saying, actually, how much do we really need to move to make it work as an athletics venue uh, and also to host concerts, which bring in significant income, um, and how much can we, uh, can we uh, you know, minimise those moves and minimise, therefore, the cost and the time. So I think that initial work, um, I would hope, uh, it's, it is work in progress. It's still being worked through. We have got a configuration for next year. We've agreed with UK Athletics that... Um, I think I would say it's a, it more than reduces, more than halves the cost. Of, more than halves the cost. Uh, but we've still got the work going on, uh, and I wouldn't want you to think that was the end of the story. We've got the work going on with the engineers, looking at a more uh, fundamental review and seeing if there's something that can reduce those costs much further. Okay, so so we can. It's very material. Without wanting to pin you down too ruthlessly, uh, we can expect it to go down by around about four million pounds, uh, but could be even more than that. That's the sort of work we're territory we're trying to get to, yes. Okay, thank you. Assemblymember Boff. Um, how can something be described as sustainable when London taxpayers will have to keep um, propping you up every year and you can't tell us when that's going to stop? How is that sustainable? Uh, well, I think I haven't said it is sustainable. I've said we're trying to reach a point where it's... Oh, it's not sustainable. Uh, right. well, no, I said and we're on a trend towards reaching that. So um, the uh, aspiration, having a business model that is about upfront investment to deliver uh, long-term regeneration gains and long-term financial returns, is that we will uh, move it towards it being financially sustainable in its own right. Um, but it is a long term, it is absolutely a long term operation. It's not something we've ever said we were going to be in any time uh, around now. And uh, we, are, we, are, we are making good progress on that, as I referred earlier. We've taken about £9 million a year out of the uh, subsidy we're requiring from the GLA over the five years of, of current plans. So um, I think we have made good progress towards reaching that uh, long term position. Um, but that is a work in progress that will be, will be long term as we, at the moment, we're still investing in, in development. We're a development corporation uh, and that's what we're there for. Um, but we're not yet uh, generating the returns that make it sustainable on its own right without so, investment. So like my, my weekly lottery ticket, I'm aiming for that expenditure to be sustainable. Uh, but I can't guarantee it in the long term. Is, is, is that what we're saying? No. 
Good. We're saying, we're saying, we're saying there's investment in tangible to, regeneration. You referred to uh, a £200 million pound provision within um, uh, for, well, a £200 million pound provision, which doesn't seem to be filled by anything. I mean, the last time I heard people explain that this sum of money isn't really under threat and we're going to get it all back. It was from the Mayor of Newham saying that £40 million investment in the E20 company was perfectly all right and we're going to get it back. We now know that £40 million isn't going to be coming back or is most unlikely, uh, unless they spend it all on lottery tickets, um, is most unlikely to come back uh, to the... the uh, residents of Newham, what guarantees have you got that that £200 million is actually going to be covered? Because in your, aunt, your previous answers, I heard no guarantees. I heard hopes, aspirations and aiming for, but no guarantees. Uh, I don't think there are any guarantees and I'm not offering any or pretending I am. Uh, what I'm saying is that, first of all, the stadium makes a massive contribution to the regeneration that delivers billions of pounds, not millions, billions of pounds of economic value to the local area. Peter referred to the uh, recent uh, Oxford Economics report, an independent review, which said there's going to be a quarter of a million more jobs than we previously anticipated in the area, and that's part of billions of pounds of economic value. The £200 million is a provision for future losses over the long term of contracts that we have uh, described in our accounts as onerous, but the work I referred to is about reducing those costs considerably, the costs as we've just talked about around seat moves, the cost of operating the stadium, the uh, simplifying the ownership, uh, the costs around uh, or the potential value from rights, all of which will significantly reduce that, uh, but that is all work that's going on at the moment. Uh, the agreements are very long term and it's important that we work through it thoroughly to get it right, but that is work that is still going on. Uh, you referred to earlier that you wanted to avoid or to get involved in any future legal challenges. Now that we know that that £40 million from Newham is effectively a, um, uh, 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 a gift from Newham uh, to E20, isn't it about time that you referred the Olympic project to the Commission to see whether or not it now falls foul, foul of the state aid regulations? Uh, I, don't I mean, you, you do it rather than wait for somebody else to do it for you. <laughs> Um, well, so I think in relation to Newham's investment, I would have to say that was for Newham to account for. So I can't, uh, I can't uh, explain or account for their uh, investment decisions. Uh, I can say, as I've said before, that first of all, I think the uh, stadium delivers enormous economic value. That we are reducing uh, the cost and taking all the measures I referred to earlier to make sure that the uh, financial burden is minimised. Uh, but that's a long-term aspiration. It's a long-term piece of work to contribute to the long-term benefits that the stadium contributes to in terms of regenerating the local area. Have you made an estimate of how much it will cost to pull out of the onerous agreement with West Ham? Uh, well, I, that's, that's, not on our, uh, that's not one of the things we're looking at because we have got a 99-year agreement um, and I think it would be, uh, I think the, uh, the, potential, uh, it, it, the potential benefit of bringing uh, or having uh, Premier League football in the area is a big part of the benefits. We, we, know I I, I, we know all that. I've read the document. But don't you think it would be wise for you to prepare for uh, uh, the pulling out of the agreement with West Ham, to at least know what the costs are going to be? Well, I think it is important that we recognise that the value that the stadium, with West Ham as a Premier League club, as the tenant, brings enormous value to the area. So, the well, it, what I'm, I'm enough, asking your question, really, my, my, it? It, such an analysis would require an analysis of both the yeah. direct financial cost to buy out uh, a Premier League club of the home they're committed to for 99 years, and of the economic value that the stadium contributes to the wider regeneration, which would be in billions, and I think that... Um, I, I don't need to do too much more detailed work to know that that's, that's probably not, not an amount that the Assembly would be keen we were uh, losing. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Assembly Member Whittle. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, David, uh, morning. I noticed that uh, obviously one of the planks of the whole development is going to be a cultural and educational mm. uh, district. Um, but um, this is absolutely to do with long-term finances of, of the whole project. Um, but I noticed that apparently the construction costs originally, for example, for the v and Museum, were going to be, uh, you were looking at philanthropic donation to cover that, and that's been abandoned, and now you're going to underwrite it. And so I wondered, 
could you just, it's now assumed, this is according to your draft budget submission, it's now assumed that the museum building development will be repaid through a rental stream over 30 years or something. Can I ask you therefore why was the philanthropic route, which would make a difference to your income, why was that abandoned? Um, I, I'm not sure what you're referring to. We haven't, it hasn't been abandoned. Uh, it hasn't? So, no. Um, so this is a, the Culture and Education District project has always, since it started, had I suppose a cocktail of, of funding that goes towards the total uh, contribution. I might need to come back to the specific words you're, you're referring to and, and explain. Uh, I'm not sure which. Well, uh, sorry, but, but I'm can just I quoting just explain here. the funding for. Sorry. I'm quoting here from. Um, uh, this was at the Budget um, Performance Committee uh, in January this year that it is now assumed that the, muse the museum building development will be repaid through a rental stream over 30 years but that originally it was philanthropic donations which were going to cover these construction costs. So the implication being somehow that you, they haven't come through, so that you're, you're now going to underwrite it. That was from last January's yes. budget submission. Okay, let, let me, so maybe I can explain where we are. And, and this right. project has had to change for reasons uh, I'll explain. Um, so uh, since the start, I suppose, the funding for the Culture and Education District has been a combination of um, government funding, uh, which is, is still secured. Uh, the money we deliver through our budgets, which you, you scrutinise. Contributions from the two universities we're bringing, UCL and uh, University of the Arts London. Uh, the proceeds of residential development on the site, which, um, uh, which would otherwise accrue to the GLA, but are agreed to be reinvested into the project. And there is a philanthropic uh, component, uh, which there was originally, and there is still that intention for. Um, Two or, three things, two or three things have changed on the project, which this will go to answer your question. So um, we did uh, originally uh, have, have in the plans a uh, museum building for the Smithsonian Museum, which was going to be yes, I know uh, that's funded gone. fully yeah. through philanthropic, and that's not going to be part of it. So that chunk that's of gone. philanthropic yeah. funding is not now being raised. But the Foundation for Future London, as a body that would uh, work with the partners uh, to, to raise a philanthropic contribution to the project. So, so when place. it comes, sorry, we have limited time compared to these guys. Uh, when, when it comes to philanthropic donations, um, there are none at the moment that have been pledged, as it were, to the building of the museum. Uh, I, I, I don't think I've said that. So the, the funding goes to the total project. It's not just to any one building. Um, the, because that is why that cocktail of funding is important. We've had to reshape the plans for the Culture and Education District on the Stratford Waterfront side because of the issues around uh, tall towers that were obstructing uh, or behind the view but it seemed to be compromising the view of St Paul's. Uh, the Mayor highlighted the need that we had to take account of the uh, London View uh, management framework in our, that, that would be a significant part of the future London plans. So we've had to change those plans, come up with new designs and we're restarting that work now. So those, those new, the new master plan went out for consultation two weeks ago. So, so it is a change the, project. You're changing the, the design or the... the, the we, we've had to change the master plan of the site, so where each building are, uh, and, and we're trying to make sure we can still fund the total, or, and we, we, are, we can still fund the total from that package of funding, but the philanthropic goes into uh, the project, if you like, rather than just to one building. Oh, I see. So, so basically... Um, if it's the whole project, then, I mean, have you got, had any, you know, we're talking about, you're saying it's a, a um, you know, considered a very, very successful regeneration, it's mm. worldwide known, et cetera, et cetera. Therefore, have you had any success with any large individuals or corporations so far? I mean, this has been going on obviously for four years, and so it's not hardly, it's hardly new. And these people like the VNA, they are internationally 100-year-old brands. It's not like you've got to explain anything. So... So there had been uh, pledges of uh, philanthropic contributions to the uh, original plans, but because we've had to rework those plans because of the planning issues I referred to, so that process is in effect being put on hold and is now uh, will recommence as the project goes forward with greater certainty. Now we have a new. Can you give plan. us an idea of sort of how much have you? As you say there has been a philanthropic input. So how much? Um, uh, well, I, th I think it's there are there were significant donations made. I'd rather not give individual amounts, but I mean, the thing is, we are constantly being told that London is more billionaires than anywhere else in the world, and there's a hell of a lot of private wealth here. I would have thought that these people would be there for the taking when it comes to putting their name to something. Huh? Well, I think it's it's uh, I'm, I'm not a I'm not a uh, 
specialist in generating philanthropic contributions. No, no, I think it is quite hard to, uh, to uh, attract uh, people to uh, put their hands in their pockets and make the sort of major commitments we're talking about. But we're very positive and we've had a lot of work done that says as we go forward with this project, it will be something that uh, significant philanthropists are willing to support because of the uh, benefits, the enormous benefits it brings to East London. Uh, we are creating a culture and education district just on the waterfront that is larger than the Pompidou Centre, bringing University College London as a new uh, university campus into the heart of East London as well. Uh, and I think it's uh, an, an unprecedented investment in uh, you know, top-class, world-class education and culture uh, into, into yeah. London to, to, to transform opportunities for local people. I get it. Yeah, no, I, I understand that. It's just that it seems to me that if you sort of know you can fall back on it being underwritten by public money or whatever, somehow maybe the incentive goes off trying to raise it seriously for this kind of scale of cultural development? But I understand that concern absolutely. I think in the, in the near future, the foundation for Future London will be, uh, you know, as the project gets firmed up and, and there will be a commitment that the Mayor will support, uh, that the Mayor very publicly uh, at the conference Sir Peter referred to earlier, uh, gave his very public commitment and support to the uh, project. He talks about it as, uh, as uh, creating a new world-class cultural destination in the Olympic Park. He looked forward personally to it becoming one of the largest cultural and education destinations in Europe. Yep, I think so having the mayor's support will that. help that philanthropic yeah, effort. Great idea. It's just a question, a question of really of the, of the money. Um, I mean, for example, uh, could you tell me, have you got any idea, even though you're changing the designs, how much, for example, will the construction of the V&A in the Olympic Park, how much will that, what's your basic ballpark figure, shall we say, for that? Well, um, Unfortunately, for different I, so we know clearly we, we, we are budgeting all these designs as we work forward, but we're going to go into procurement on this. Uh, we've got to go into planning and then go into procurement. So if I told you the budget for an individual uh, project now, I'd be uh, exposing to the contractor market what our, what our pricing is. So that's not information I'd, I'd, I'd give. And I would refer, you know, I think in even refer back to my previous role on the Olympics, I think we were as transparent about costing on projects there as any other, as any public investment's ever been in the UK. Um, but we never released contract price uh, budgets before contracts were signed. Absolutely. And I think we need to go through the procurement process, yeah. get contractors signed up, and then we'll be able to be uh, open about the costs or the cost budgets for individual uh, projects. But it is absolutely part of our plans. It's part of the scrutiny uh, we have with the GLA team uh, and the, the budgets that you see in, in, in the Assembly have been scrutinised as part of that and that the board sees. Um, but to publicly release them would tell the uh, contractor market what our budgets are. Okay, thank you. Thank okay, you. thank you. Uh, next is Assembly Member Dr. Sahota. Right. Um, <clears throat> we've, uh, we've seen in the corporate performance report that the LDC views increased construction costs in London due to Brexit as one of its key risks. Um, is the LDC resilient to Brexit? Ooh. Um, <laughs> I think we see. I think I suppose we see two particular challenges arising um, as as a result. And you know, I think like any any organisation planning its future, we're, we're uncertain at the moment how uh, how the UK's exit from the European Union is going to actually uh, manifest itself uh, and what the economic consequences are. And I don't think I'm in the business of sort of speculating about that. Um, and there's plenty of other people who do. I think we see the, the risks we refer to are mainly in two main categories. Uh, we see we have got uh, significant housing development. We anticipate significant future housing receipts. And I think um, the uncertainty there is in the housing market um, already and uh, the uncertainty about how that will uh, develop uh, post um, the UK exiting from the European Union is a risk to our uh, financial position. Um, the second big category of risk is around, is around cost. Um, because we've got major construction projects, because we've got uh, budgets of the type we were just referring to, not just for housing, but also for the culture and education district. If, for example, uh, there was a con a constriction in the uh, labour market in the UK, uh, in the construction uh, trades, for example, um, with less uh, workforce available, that would push inevitably push prices up, and that would uh, push up construction inflation and push the costs on our contracts. So we see risks and uncertainty, I think, on the income side on the long-term receipts and on uh, the cost of construction. But how that pans out, like other bodies, we're, we're, we're uncertain until we know more. 
Well, uh, absolutely. But um, what, would, how, what would the view of the LDC be on leaving the EU without a deal in place? And what does the LDC need <laughs> from, from a Brexit deal, ideally? I don't think I'm going to comment on the uh, political rights and wrongs. That's a political issue I, I would so you, you, have, you, have, to you have no idea what you would like to see in the Brexit deal to uh, minimise the no. risks to LDC? I don't say no. Uh, I didn't say that. <laughs> I mean, that's, uh, that, that would be amazing serious thing to say, that I, I have no idea what we need from this deal. I mean, you know what the risks are. How can you minimise those risks? Uh, so I, I can, I think, account for what the organisation can do to minimise the risk, but not what uh, the UK uh, government and its negotiation with the European okay, Union. Okay, then what steps are you taking to protect yourself from a bad deal? Right. Uh, so that, that we can certainly answer. So uh, we, we are absolutely looking at all our uh, housing plans um, to uh, look at uh, our long-term plan for delivering housing. Uh, we're looking to accelerate housing uh, sooner and deliver more affordable housing in accordance with the Mayor's uh, policy. But in doing so, we have to look at our long-term financial plans and see that those will be sustainable. And, and uh, the consequences for, of uh, a, an exit from the European Union is one of the factors we've been looking at. So, for example, we've been taking a lot of uh, advice and analysis around projections on, on um, both housing receipts in future and on uh, uh, the cost issues I refer to to see what uh, evidence there is and what uh, views there are on the future trends, to see how, uh, and doing the sort of sensitivity analysis on, on the interface between the receipts and costs of future housing developments, so that we can come to a, um, a prudent view, but a sensible view, that delivers housing as quickly as possible, delivers as much affordable housing as quickly as possible, but does so in a financially uh, responsible way that um, doesn't expose the organisation to more risk than, than we can sustain. And that is making judgments about what yeah. might inflation be in three, four, five years' time, what might house price uh, inflation be, and trying to make judgments about those, taking good advice, taking uh, the best evidence, and also then applying some sensible uh, contingency planning and prudence around that mm. so that we're not overexposing the organisation. And that is absolutely the work that we're doing. Um, it is why I referred earlier to um, our financial plan not being locked down at the moment. Is, that is one of the significant uh, factors. And it is a very active discussion we're having uh, with the board uh, and with, with colleagues at City Hall so that we've got an agreed basis that recognises those risks, doesn't expose the organisation uh, unduly, but delivers as much housing and as much affordable housing as quickly as possible. Good. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Um, wait for Assemblymember Cooper to take a seat, um, as I'll be calling her next as the first speaker. I do have some other people coming back in, but they've already spoken. Uh, but before I call you, Assemblymember Cooper, let's breathe out and welcome to the Chamber Edinburgh Primary School from the wonderful borough of Waltham Forest. <laughs> Hello. Hello. <laughs> Welcome. <coughs> right, Assemblymember Cooper. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, I just wanted to ask you about progress uh, on dealing with the uh, quite catastrophically large um, gender pay gap. And you had an action plan um, with a series of 15 different actions, most of which, or well, all of which, apart from one, were to be completed before the date of this meeting. And I just wondered if you could tell us about the progress and whether you've completed all those actions. Uh, yeah, I think we've made very good progress on this. Um, it's, uh, it, it is a challenge, I think. I think with a small organisation, measuring these, the, the, the differentials can be distorted by very small numbers of, uh, of, of movements in people. Uh, but I think when the original data you're referring to was published, uh, our uh, gender pay gap was, there were different measures, but between 33 and 35%. Uh, uh, the, we uh, re-ran the analysis after we'd taken uh, a number of steps uh, earlier this year, and that had come down by around 10% uh, uh, on each measure, so uh, we were down in the sort of low 20% uh, on, the, on the median and, and mean. Um, that is very much work in progress, again, because we, are, uh, we have, for example, uh, changed our, our recruitment arrangements, um, so we are promoting flexible working, not only internally within the organisation, which we've always done, but more actively in our, in our recruitment. We've been running an intensive uh, leadership development programme, uh, which has helped uh, uh, create opportunities for female internal candidates being successful in promotion. There's a lot of steps like that, but I think the action plan is, is uh, the, the steps are all in, in place. 
uh, and the actual reduction in the gap has already uh, started to manifest itself. Well, I'm glad to hear that it has come down. The figures that we had were from March uh, 2016 when the, um, yeah. the, uh, the functional bodies were looked at. Um, but on those figures, that then comes down from 35% to 25%. Even if, even if I take your other figures of 20%, that is still a lot higher than any of the rest of the GLA family, and it's a lot higher than uh, London itself as well. Now, you've mentioned what you're doing around flexible working, um, I presume that some of the other sort of quick wins in your list of tasks have also been gone through in terms of more gender-neutral languages that are used for recruitment adverts in looking at the posts and the language used in the job descriptions and person specifications. Can you confirm that you've gone through all of that as well? Yes, I can absolutely confirm we've done all those things. Um, we've also uh, had, um, uh, we've been running a complete conscious uh, programme of um, unconscious bias training uh, across the organisation. Everybody's uh, attended that. So we, I think, which is another item in the plan. So all those uh, areas, I think the, the wording, the language in recruitment, uh, we've been piloting uh, sort of uh, candidate blind recruitment uh, so that uh, the identity of the candidates isn't known to uh, recruiters. So yes, all those steps have been in place and that's contributed to the reduction, but it will, you know, obviously there's an existing workforce of the organisation, so to actually affect long the change well, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because uh, the, the other aspect that was covered in the action plan was the issue of sort of gro uh, growing um, internal talent, uh, and so some of the actions were also to try and send people, um, perhaps to other parts of the GLA family, to have some um, attention paid to them so they can um, take the promotion path. Have you been doing that as well? Have you seen some people stepping up from one role and being recruited into mm. more senior posts? That's a really important area, I think. Well, yeah. so I mentioned we've run a really intense, still going on actually, a really intensive programme of leadership development for the organisation, uh, which has been very well intended and well uh, developed. Um, we have, I mean, one example of what you but described. But my question is, is has it paid off? Have you seen those promotions coming through well, yet? Well, uh, yes, and, and increasing female promotion is one of the reasons the gap has come down. So, uh, uh, absolutely, yes. Um, the, uh, uh, it, the GLA family point you asked about, uh, we have, for example, um, uh, supported um, the uh, Old Oak Common uh, uh, Development Corporation with capacity, giving people opportunities to uh, develop their careers there. So that's something we've done. Um, uh, and we, I suppose we are a big part of the of the move towards greater uh, shared services across the GLA family, and um, you know, working working collegially with other opportunities. The, the opportunities you describe have to be, you know, the opportunities have to come up and the individual available. But certainly, we're very mindful that where those do come forward, uh, we're we're looking to promote those. That, thanks very much. Obviously, we're mindful of the fact that you are a, a small part yeah. of the GLA family, so those external. Thank you, Chair. Assembly Member Desai. I was hoping to raise this earlier, Chair, but I will raise it anyway. Um, it relates to a comment made by Assembly Member Andrew Boss. No, you can put yeah, a I'm, question, yeah, you can put a question you, yeah. or you can give uh, me a statement. David, I don't want to draw into a party political spat, uh, but <laughs> following advice that I received from the Secretariat, I've got no choice but to put my question to you. Um, you can't speak with Newham Council, obviously, but Newham are partners with LLDC in E20. Yeah. Is your understanding that the money Newham has put into, L into E20 is a loan? Um, well, I, th I think I said earlier, I think the, the, the accounting for Newham's investment into E20 is, is, is for Newham to do. I don't think it's for yeah. me to. Uh, it, it's of the form of uh, a loan uh, agreement, but the account... I you don't answered that be question. I'm it's a loan Newham's and commitment. not a gift. So it's completely wrong for Assembly Member Boff to say that it's a gift. It's a loan. Now, when it is paid and all that, is, we can talk about it. But for you to Thank say it's a gift, it's completely wrong. Thank and you. Thank you. A misrepresentation both. of the situation. I made my point, Chair. Thank you. You've asked a question. Thank you. To make a point, you'd have to give me a standing order. Okay. Thank you. Assembly Member Bailey. I, um, I just, I've just read here. You, your desire is to pr produce fifteen hundred, nearly fifteen hundred. Um, affordable homes above the, the target that the London plan is set. And I just uh, wonder... Um, Assembly Member Bailey, you're strained. Am I strained? Excuse yeah. me, Chair. Excuse me. You're strained. You're so keen here today. Well, I, I indicated and you accepted. Yes, no. We will call you later. Okay. Okay. Um, that's all the members I've, I've got for finance. So can I... Now, say to I guess we now want to hear your answers to the second question in the name of Assembly Member Shaw, 
what will you do differently from previous chairs? So that's clearly to Sir Peter Hendy. Um, that's not a terribly easy question to answer. Um, I didn't, there's, there hasn't been a chair for um, many months, uh, and I didn't particularly know the previous one as it happens. Um, but um, what I would say, having turned up at the LRDC, is that it's a very strong board. Uh, the executive is very strong and very competent, in my view. Um, and you've only got to look around to see how much has been achieved in the in the previous uh, few years there. Um, so I think David's been through it exhaustively, uh, both the issues about the stadium, about the culture and education district and about housing, which are the three uh, biggest issues. And we've already covered the remit that the mayor has given me to start looking at the, um, the finite life of the organisation, what the best model to succeed LLDC is, which I said I would, uh, we, we will start attending to in early 2018. Um, so if that's what the previous chairs did, well, I'm going to do more of it. If it's not, that's what I think I should be doing now. Uh, v very interesting. And uh, I mean, obviously, over the years, uh, you are the fourth chair uh, since uh, 2015, April 2015, and as, as you've heard, there are very serious concerns about uh, the, the sort of sustainability, medium and long term. Uh, I mean, the, the previous chair of the LLDC, Boris Johnson, presided over spiral, spiraling costs, what we've heard today. The obviously poor contracts, uh, and his successor resigned after uh, the current mayor uh, announced his review. Hopefully, the review will herald some changes in direction for the LLDC. Can I ask you, how will you learn from these mistakes so as not to add to this, what, what has been described as total and utter mess? I don't know who described it like that, but it doesn't seem to me to be a total and utter mess. You've heard David describe this morning very uh, strong uh, moves in order to increase revenue and reduce costs in the place. Um, there are some big issues to deal with, um, but the fact remains, on any, uh, on any comparative basis across the world, this is probably the most successful um, uh, uh, development corporation or anything like it that anybody's ever seen. And in terms of the Olympic legacy, um, in comparison to um, even the, the Olympic stadia anywhere else in the developed world since the Second World War, the stadium's got uses, and it, and it demonstrably so. So, um, I mean, David's already described to you, you can't, uh, you can look at the place on a current accounting basis, but actually it's real successes in regenerating um, the area, uh, regenerating East London, providing jobs for people, providing houses for people, giving them a better and more secure future with more skills, uh, and in creating uh, world-class facilities for London and, and, and the country. And I think on, on those grounds, you have to judge it as a long-term enterprise, because if you don't, you won't be recognising um, what clearly the, the whole thing is, is about. Uh, <clears throat> three months on the job, are you satisfied with uh, how the LRDC is engaging with local communities? For example, as you heard at confirmation hearing, there is still an ongoing issue and, and problems uh, as uh, uh, and as uh, sort of witnessed uh, by activic, activists, you know, during their uh, campaign and uh, sort of day-to-day -day, uh, sort of experience. Uh, at uh, the confirmation hearing, you told us that you would have a look and see what needs to be done. Can you tell us uh, so far what have you gleaned and what is your approach going to be in engaging uh, communities uh, like uh, the current uh, campaigners? Uh, uh, of uh, Hackney Week, as well as uh, uh, many other local residents uh, who obviously have views and uh, want to be positively engaged. So, um, as, <coughs> as you know, uh, the board has on it the mayors of the four boroughs, which are the constituent um, the, 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 in which the uh, development corporation sits. Uh, I've chaired I think two meetings, possibly three, uh, but um, uh, John Biggs, the mayor of Tower Hamlets, has 
certainly came to the last one, and he re raised those issues, and we and I gave him, as I should do, the, the full opportunity of saying what he thought about the uh, the two bridges and the uh, development in Fish Island, uh, which he did, uh, and we did have a full discussion, oh, um, and I yeah. asked for it to be minuted, <laughs> and. Um, um, I'm just so sorry, Sir Peter. That is down as a question that will be led by Assembly Member Russell. So if you can just, I, I will accept that you will pick up the details of uh, questions about the bridges at Fish Island um, with um, Assembly Member Russell. Chair, um, yeah. Will you accept that? Assembly I will accept Chair. that. I'll, I'll simply like to yes. conclude by saying that uh, there are serious concerns about the uh, ability of uh, LLDC to engage positively and genuinely with local communities. And this is something I'd very much like LLDC and Sir, Sir Peter Handy, you as the Chair, that uh, there is that change in approach uh, of the LNDC. So, so let me say one other thing generally, which is that we contemplated the level of consultation on, um, on the revised local plans at the last board meeting. And one of the things that I wanted to establish with clarity is that the arrangements we made to consult the local communities were as good or better than the arrangements that, the four, that each of the four boroughs would have used themselves and do use. Uh, and I think, David, we went away with the conclusion that, that we would do no less than the four mm. boroughs would have done themselves, uh, and possibly more. That seems to me to be a reasonable clarity of whether or not our consultation is as good as the planning authorities would otherwise have, cons of, 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 have uh, carried out had we not been there. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm, I'm happy with uh, that. So Assembly far. Member Pigeon. Yes, I would like to ask Sir Peter, as chair of the LLDC, you will take direction from the mayor, which you may not always agree with. Um, you were the commissioner of TfL at the time of the Garden Bridge fiasco. What lessons have you learned from the mistakes made at that time? Um, what lessons have I learned from the mistakes made at the time? Well, I've read the I've read the re, I've read the report. You've had the benefit now, of, or if you can, if you can find the time to, of trudging through all of the interviews uh, with um, with Mrs. Hodge. Um, I think if you read the transcript of my interview with Mrs. Hodge, you will discover that there are moments when you might not necessarily agree with the mayor, um, and uh, you might tell him that. Um, if I find moments in this job, I'll tell him. So will you be very clear and ask for very specific directions to make sure that proper process is in place, unlike what happened with the Garden Bridge? Well, I'm not sure that I've come in to discuss the Garden Bridge, um, because that seems to have been exhaustive, exhaustively discussed elsewhere. Um, I did answer at the confirmatory hearing the fact that this is a properly constituted body, it's got an audit committee, it reviews what goes on. Um, it would be presumptuous to say an a public organisation of any size uh, is, uh, follows its own rules uh, without checking, which is what audit committees do and external auditors do. Uh, we have uh, an audit committee, we have external auditors. Um, we will check everything. So you would not... Um, expect LLDC to start work on a project ahead of a very clear mayoral direction unless it was in your business plan? I'm not quite sure where you're going with that. Well, I, I, think, I think... No, 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 I don't want you to answer, David. This is for Peter. Um, it's very clear from the work we've been doing that um, decisions, um, the mayoral direction came at a later stage, yet expenditure had been spent by TfL and others. And I just want to make sure the LLDC, given the state of your finances, doesn't start off on a course without having a very clear mayoral direction. Um, well, well, that would presume that mayoral directions are the source of every every action that the organisation takes, and that's clearly not the, not no, the but case. but it's something actually. outside your business plan. No, we have everything in our business Well, there you go. He's, 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 I didn't hear what you said, David. Sorry. So, well, if I can, so we have an annual budget and business plan process, and we incorporate everything into that, and that goes through the mayor and and your scrutiny process. So, um, 
I suppose beyond some initial thinking work, we wouldn't do anything significant on any project that's not incorporated on that. Uh, I, very I, good. That's very clear. Thank you very much. Um, now I'd like to ask you about E20's governance arrangements, Sir Peter. They've been criticised for lacking proper oversight. What measures will you take as chair to ensure E20 are properly held accountable, including um, a projected annual loss of around £2 million? Well, I think the answer to that is that, as David has described, that there are very active, um, um, uh, the organisation is very active to review all of those arrangements. I don't, I don't think that's a, I, I don't think that's a, so much a criticism of governance arrangements. It's actually a consequence of the commercial arrangements, actually. And if there were no work going on, you would want us to say there was work going on, but actually there is work going on. The fact that we can't say how it's concluded yet is okay. testament to the fact that it's quite difficult to do. But I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a governance issue. It's a consequence of, the, of, the, of all these this, uh, hierarchy of contractual arrangements. Okay, and then my final question. Um, in your um, the 10 year plan, you're going to be looking at building so many homes, but it doesn't account for childcare demand. Will you, as the incoming chair, ask for a review to make sure enough new nursery places and other facilities are on site to support families living at the Olympic Park? Uh, well, it's never been raised with me before, so the first thing I'll do is go and find out what's there. Okay, I don't think there's anything. It talks about school places and nursery and schools, but before three, you need to have childcare provision, and that's something that seems to be lacking. Okay, well, now you've raised it, we'll have a look at it. Thank you very much. Hey, Assemblymember McCartney. Yes, my question is firstly to Peter, and it's about accessibility in the park. Obviously, you've come along as chair at a time of heightened national security. I'm just wondering, is, has that had any impact on the accessibility or the park being seen as a welcoming place to um, attend? Well, <coughs> excuse me. I, I, I'm certainly aware, because I've taken some... Uh, trouble to have a look at it. In fact, the executive commissioned a, a, uh, a full report about about mm. health and safety, which included the security of the park, which I've read and the board has discussed. Um, and it is clearly um, a matter that we should keep under absolutely continuous review in the light of some pretty appalling things that have happened both in this city and elsewhere. Uh, the review seemed to me at least to be comprehensive. It, it looked at all of the things that uh, needed to be done. Um, I haven't, unless somebody tells me differently, con concluded or seen anybody concluding that that's at the expense of accessibility, uh, and it shouldn't be. It, it's, a, it's a big issue. I'm not unfamiliar with it from former jobs and other places, it's a big issue to uh, seek to protect the public in, in big public spaces uh, and I think so far everything I've seen at the LLDC suggests that they take it seriously, um, that the work that's been done is appropriate um, and that, 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 that it's under constant review. Yeah, I, think, I think we can absolutely reassure you on that. I think we have, we have inevitably, you know, over the various um, uh, security related incidents that have been for the last 18 months or so um, we've we, we work very closely with Metropolitan Police and the relevant security agencies uh, and we take measures to uh, that we can as appropriate to reinforce the security but we've I don't think there's anything that's been done that's compromised the uh, accessibility uh, you know it was one of the absolute priorities for the 2012 games that we have been very proud to sustain that we aim to be uh, the most accessible uh, part. We're absolutely as accessible as we can be. All the venues uh, to be as accessible as they can be, and indeed the housing and the new uh, major commercial developments. Uh, absolutely accessibility uh, at the heart of design of those and of the operation. And I don't believe there's anything we've done to enhance security that has compromised that. Fine. I want to ask, uh, because the summer athletics, um, I, we, we noticed that the Daily Mobility Service mm. on the park's website said that arrangements for the 2017 Summer of Athletics may impact routes around the park and limit the buggy service normally available. Then your review after the um, athletics stated that there were some operational challenges, particularly around crowd movement and where some of the security yeah. um, mm. arrangements were taking the searches were taking place. I just wondered if that had had an impact on accessibility, whether groups had contacted you, and, and, and also 
you did have a built environment access panel. I just wondered if that's still ongoing and are they reviewing those issues? Yeah, no, we, we still do. That is yeah. still ongoing, just to deal with the last point. So the challenges we had over the summer, um, so first of all, I think to deal with your original question, it, it, we did have challenges with the mobility service, but it wasn't due to the security right. measures. Okay. Um, I suppose there were, there were two or three factors. We had uh, enormous crowds, um, and with, with uh, the major athletics events, you sometimes have you know, uh, more than one session in a day, so you have crowds going out when others are coming in, and you have you know, very, very large numbers of people uh, accessing uh, the, the main routes. Uh, and I think the, um, you know, where the buggy service normally operates at our uh, information point as you uh, come into the stadium is the main route both for people coming in and out. So if you've had you know, 55,000 people in the stadium and that they're leaving as more are coming in, you've got over 100,000 people trying to go through that route at one time. So it was just a space issue. Um, the individual mobility uh, arrangements that are put in place for individual events are the responsibility of the event owners. Uh, and we did raise with uh, the 2017 World Athletics organisers uh, trying to make sure the mobility service was as good as it could possibly be and as good as we and our regular users of the park expect. Um, and uh, there were some concerns at the start of the summer's athletics around that and it got improved and addressed. And actually some of that was a communication issue that it hadn't been communicated as well as it could what, what services were available. And that was improved uh, certainly for the large crowds that came to the, uh, the, the, uh, World, the IAAF World Athletics. So um, I don't, I'm, I'm confident, as I said at the start, that the uh, security measures haven't compromised uh, accessibility in the mobility service. We're absolutely still uh, supporting that, and uh, I think it was actually reported in one of our recent board papers, we are putting new arrangements on future event operators to make sure the mobility service is maintained at the level that, that we all have come to, uh, to, to, to know and, uh, and expect. <coughs> Assembly Member Gavron. Thank you. Good morning, Peter and David. I, I want to ask a question about convergence, the convergence framework and the target that was set for it. But just to give a bit of context, and the first question is really addressed to Peter. You were there, Peter. When, when we were all Always. thinking about the bid for the Olympics, the main, the primary driver was to regenerate, inner East, to use it as a catalyst, to regenerate inner East London and um, where we had the biggest concentration of multiply deprived communities in the whole of Western Europe. And we were a bit haunted by the fact, and you've referred to it, that many Olympics don't regenerate their area. Many regeneration projects don't lift the lives of the people who live in the wider area. So it was very great that in fact, we did what no other city had done. We set up with the, the boroughs and the Olympic, um, was it the Olympic Legacy, De uh, it was called the Olympic Le Legacy Development Company, um, set up this conference, this con convergence vision um, and framework, which was with the aim of giving the same social and economic chances um, to the people of the neighbouring boroughs, the six growth boroughs, as people had across London. Now, in the early years, there was a huge flurry of activity to bring in local people on low incomes into the jobs, low skilled people. Now, you've talked about the influx, both of you, of the new, the new really world-class employers that are coming. How are you going to ensure that people on low incomes have the same chance to get those jobs as the higher skilled people who are moving into the six growth boroughs? So, well, I'm, I'm in a high level that effort is still there. Mm. It's clearly still there. And, and what I've seen since I've been there is a concerted effort for um, the people coming, whoever they are, uh, creating jobs in the uh, international quarter and discussion uh, and, and here east and discussions about the cultural and education quarter and with the ed educational institutions to ensure that those opportunities still go to, to, to local people, that it's, that it's not wholly an influx of um, people from outside that there are benefits. So David, whilst yeah. I'm saying that, David can find all of the details, but I wanted to be clear when I came that though, that, that early effort is still being carried out and, and, and I feel very confident that it is. Yeah, I mean I think we, particularly on the, on the jobs and skills side, uh, it's 
I think it's been one of our great success stories. I think we have a really dedicated function that works very well with the boroughs, it works with their, um, uh, their, their support to local people in their areas to uh, ensure that they are best placed, that local people are best placed to have the skills, have the capability to take on the new jobs uh, that are uh, created. Um, and uh, you know, that, I think that has been very successful to date on the construction programme and I mentioned earlier uh, on the initial sort of long-term jobs coming out of the venues and, and, and the park. But now the challenge, as you say, going forward is there's going to be much more uh, high-level jobs and I think that's a, that's a great development. That's reflecting uh, the area moving up uh, and, and better. You know, we've, we've had a very high level of, uh, high number of retail I... jobs available, but now we're going to have jobs in universities, in cultural organisations and in, yes. and in tech. So we are working, we, my answer is the machine that has done it so far is that's already so working true. with the incoming partners and working with them to identify bursaries, to new employment schemes, uh, uh, internships, work experience good. for local people. It's good to hear that. To I just sure. want to ask you, I just want to say another can, question. Can, can I just, we've also formed a new forum that UCL are coordinating uh, work with the, us, with the Boers, uh, as a London uh, Prosperity Forum to lead that work and coordinate okay. that activity. Right, okay. Sorry, it's just I do want to follow up because it's very welcome what you've been saying, but I just want to say that the data, the monitoring data, um, which looks at what's going on in the six growth boroughs, is showing that there is improvement on the indices of deprivation which yeah. relate to poverty in some of the boroughs, but there are still some statistics which show a worsening situation. And obviously what we need now is practical action. And I want to ask you, is there going to be a sort of revitalization, a reaffirmation in a sense, um, a new focus to the convergence agenda because it's needed? So I don't think we've changed our approach, if I can say it that way, but I think it's not something that we can answer on our own. The, the work that's been on convergence over the years, and I think you referred to it going back to the bit, was a joint effort that the uh, Mayor of London, the boroughs, uh, and us and our predecessor organisation was, was, was part of and working together on. But it is much broader than uh, the, the area that LLDC can influence uh, in, with our planning boundary. But absolutely for us, the measures we're taking around bringing new world-class employers into the area and helping local people be best placed to get those roles and working with those employers to engage local people is, is I think, a big contribution to do that. But we can't answer your question in total ourselves. It's a, it's a much bigger area problem that needs the engagement of City Hall and needs the engagement of the boroughs uh, themselves. So, so we can only do so much. Uh, and I wouldn't... Sorry. Thank you. Don't answer. Press the mayor, please. <laughs> okay, that's uh, all the members who have indicated for that second question. Let's then go on to the third question. So can, can we have answers to the question in the name of Assemblymember Whittle, LLDC and the current housing climate? Yes, I think the uh, question was, uh, are the current plans too ambitious? Um, which uh, I suppose I was, I was pleased that was the question. I think we're well, proud that be. our plans are ambitious, exactly. Uh, we're we're pr proud that we are trying to be as ambitious as we uh, possibly can, because I think as a development corporation, that is what we're here for. Uh, and we are trying to uh, really transform an area that was in great need of that uh, transformation. Um, we have made good progress on housing. Um, not directly delivered by us, but you know, I, I referred earlier that the former Olympic Village is now a very successful home to uh, 3,000 uh, uh, occupants. There's new development going up there, some uh, four or 500 further units now under construction. Our first development at Trobham Manor is nearing completion, and we've accelerated the next two developments at East Wick and Sweetwater, uh, which are going to be delivered uh, a number of years earlier than previously planned. Um, those plans obviously were delivered, a bit like the answer to the previous question, under, under the previous mayor and the previous mayor's policies. And so we have been looking at those and saying, uh, actually, can we be more ambitious? Can we do more? You, you, you know, are we being too ambitious? The question is, can we do more sooner? Um, and that is what we're looking to do. And as go back to the financial conversation, we have to do that in a way that is uh, financially sustainable. There are changes in the housing market. Um, you know, there are government policy changes around uh, social housing rents. There's all the changes we talked about in the economy. That is making it challenging, uh, but absolutely our ambition is to do more and sooner. Well, thank you. 
I think I'm out of time, but okay. can I just add one remark? Am I no, allowed? No, 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 no. <laughs> Thank you for your very comprehensive answer. Time. Um, Assembly Member Copley. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I, I've got a question about um, building successful uh, and integrated neighbourhoods. And I want to ask, um, sort of first of all, just very directly, has the LLDC formally adopted the Mayor's target of 50% for all new homes across the park? Um, I think we, we are absolutely working with the Mayor's team to, towards that policy, but we have got existing, both an existing local plan and an existing uh, planning permission that was given long before uh, the, that policy was set. So the challenge, as I said, is to look at how we revisit and amend those plans so we can get to uh, work towards achieving those, those policies. So we're absolutely aligned with the Mayor's objectives. Obviously, we're a mayoral body. We want to achieve what the Mayor has set as his policy. But we have got existing contracts, uh, projects that are in contract, so, um, one particularly well advanced in construction, uh, and that is part of a, a, an extant planning permission across the whole site. So we have to work within that so to see not, how far much further we can go. You've not formally then adopted the 50% target at the moment? Well, I'm not, I'm not sure what you mean by... For, I mean, it is absolutely something we're committed to trying to do it's everything we can to achieve. It's a, yeah. It is what we are working towards. And so is that going yes. to be... Is that because, as you point out, you've, you've already got um, developments that are completed or nearing completion that have been going yeah. in planning. Would that 50% be across the whole park or would it be just across the, the developments that are coming up in the future? No, so the sites that are already uh, done, un done. under construction or under contract, we... We would delay housing and deliver less housing if we went back and tried to reopen those and renegotiate them, and that is a position we've agreed with uh, the Mayor and, and, and City Hall colleagues. What we're doing is looking at our future developments and saying how can we get to uh, that policy and how can we do so more quickly. The, across the future developments? Across, across, the, future across development. the future developments. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that clarity. Um, now, I mean, if we look at the development so far, so you've got Chubber Manor and Sweetwater have each got less, I think, less than 30% affordable housing on them. Uh, Stratford Waterside won't have any affordable housing on it because the receipts are going into the cultural quarter, I think I'm right in saying. And then you've got two further future developments, Rick Roberts Way and Pudding Mill, which are both outside of the Olympic cute. Park itself. Do you think there's a, there's a temp te there'll be a, a temptation to put the, the affordable housing on land that is cheaper, uh, further away from the cultural uh, attractions, and to make uh, uh, a significant proportion of it shared ownership in order to get you up to the 50% to the target? Well, I just would say physically Pudding Mill is, is very adjacent. It's actually almost adjacent to uh, where the new University College London campus will be, so I don't think it's a further away or, or more, more distant site, and Rick Roberts Way is not significantly further. So no, I, I don't think the location is a big factor. It's just the sequencing of development. Um, the, the projects you referred to, Chobham Manor, is the first phase is almost complete. Uh, Eastwick and Sweetwater is contracted and due to start on site <coughs> in the year. The uh, Stratford Waterfront is, as you described, um, subsidising and supporting the development of the culture and education district facilities. So it is putting Mill Lane and Rick Roberts Way that we're looking at to say, in the light of the new policy, as you said, you know, can we reach the mayor's policy of 50% and can we uh, accelerate delivery? And that's what we're working with to make sure we do that in such a way that is also financially sustainable. But do you see, I mean, uh, have you got any uh, sort of, any idea, any conception of what the sort of tenure split we're going to see on affordable housing? Are we going to see, you know, is it going to be a lot of shared ownership because that's obviously easier to deliver than social housing to get well, you up to this? I think all I'm going to say on that is, you asked at the beginning, was we uh, formally adopting the Mayor's policy? We will work really closely with uh, the Mayor's policy as it uh, firms up on uh, social housing tenures. Uh, we're working not only at the affordability high level target, the 50%, but also at the mix within that, the mix of tenures within the affordable. We're liaising very closely with uh, the housing team um, and we're making sure we will be on, you know, on all fours with that policy. Okay, thank you. Assembly member... Oh, sorry. Boff. Two minutes. The local plan says that LLDC will uh, exceed the London plan's target of 1,471 housing units per annum. Does that remain your aspiration? So, uh, in the current plan, I think actually we're delivering slightly ahead of what the uh, total was. I haven't actually got the figures, but I know last time I looked we, was, we were slightly exceeding the annual 
um, run rate, if you like, to achieve our 24,000 total over the life of the plan. So per annum? You've got a per annum figure. You've got total I'm saying that so far we're exceeding it, and it's not changed, but we are uh, reviewing the local plan, so our local plan is, so that local plan is extant and that, is that figure is still there, yes. Is that total numbers going to increase or decrease, do you think? The 24,000? Yeah. Uh, well, it's difficult to say today. On tr the current trend, we're, ex we're on trend to exceed it, but we have got a local plan process and you'd expect me to say, and of course we should consult with uh, the local community and the interested stakeholders, so I can't presume the outcome of a local plan now, but um, the current tra trend in housing unit delivery is ahead of what the original plan was and ahead of that annual profile. When do you expect the phasing of the affordable homes to come online? Are we going to have uh, all the expensive stuff first and then the affordable down the way, or is it affordable housing going to be delivered at the same pace? Are you talking across the developments? Or yeah. So across the developments, it, it is specific to individual planning permissions. Uh, we give a planning permission to, we've got a uh, planning permission for individual sites which agree, um, uh, and obviously the Mayor's policy is a material consideration for the planning committee, but it, it is planning uh, is, is given site by site, so I can't answer that <coughs> generically so, across all 24 So you can't, give a per, you can't give a per annum target for affordable homes? Um, I think that is information we could find for you, but I don't have it to hand at the moment. I so we could advise you with that. that. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Then, right, let's move on then to uh, getting answers on the question in the name of <coughs> Assemblymember Russell, proposed H14 road and H16 pedestrian bridges at Fish Island. Do you want to just answer? Yeah. Uh, yes, if you could answer so, the written question, that would be yeah. great. So the, the, qu the question was, so was, was about the review that TfL had been asked to conduct uh, on the traffic impacts. Um, and uh, just to put that in context, so the Mayor asked TfL we, th there was a traffic impact that had been done originally. It was taken to our uh, planning committee uh, earlier this year. That was before the new mayor's draft transport strategy uh, was introduced. And so when uh, the new draft transport strategy came in, in uh, the mayor asked TfL to uh, re-review the traffic impacts and the uh, traffic assessment uh, in the light of that. And that work is going on, so it was only uh, commissioned uh, recently, we expect it. I don't think it will take long. It will. It, it's a short number of uh, weeks. Uh, we're expecting that to com complete shortly, and obviously we'll then review the conclusions. Um, if it does highlight significant problems, obviously we'd have to uh, review that and look at the plans in that light. But um, you know that that's work that's going on that we're working with TfL on. Thank, thank you very much. Um, could I ask um, Sir Peter now? Um, the about the assumptions um, that are being made with this new traffic modelling, um, as the assumptions are what determine the outcomes of the modelling. What is the new model that you're running now based on? Are you rerunning the same model as before and trying to prove the same thing, or are you running a significantly different different model? And can we see what those assumptions are? Uh, I've no idea. But I'm sure David would, can. Would you be? That's it's, it's TfL. Who, Peter's other role is in Network Rail, not TfL, to be clear. So, yeah, so I've, I've given up traffic modelling as a job. Are you happy that, to publish the assumptions that are going into this new review of the traffic modelling? Right, so the review is being done by TfL, not by us. So it is, the mayor asked TfL to look at it. He did. Um, and the, um, the the question that's being asked is: Does the original assessment uh, need to change? in the light of the new transport strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, I have to say, I don't know how TfL are going about doing that. They will be looking at what's changed in the transport strategy, I assume, and, okay. and looking at the impact. Fine, let's, let's step back a bit. The current plans which were produced under Mayor Johnson make a footbridge, H14, into a road bridge. And that is effectively punching a new road from the Olympic Park right through to the A12, cutting through Fish Island, which is currently a really good example of a low traffic, people friendly neighbourhood. Isn't this just creating a rat run? Uh, well, the analysis that was done, and obviously, as I said, it's being updated, is that with all the development that's happening in the area, the traffic analysis that was carried out before was that there is going to be congestion in that area anyway, if you like, just because there is so much new housing, new schools, new 
uh, employment opportunities, that, that there is going to be significant congestion, that the new route that was proposed will help relieve congestion. Oh, but you, you seem to be assuming that the, this new housing will be made in a way that is car dependent. If the I, mayor is going to achieve the massive shift he needs from cars and, and, and taxis to reach his, he's got a 2041 target of 80% of us travelling by walking, cycling and public transport. So I don't see how um, c creating this extra road with extra traffic is actually going to help him to reach his target to cut down so, traffic and get more people so, travelling so, on foot so, and by so, bike so and public maybe transport. I can help because uh, one of the benefits of the LLDC board is that the mayors of the boroughs uh, attend, and indeed the mayor of Tower Hamlets did attend the last meeting, and um, he uh, spoke on this at some length, and we will record a very full minute of what he said. Um, but one of the things that John Biggs said was that he noted that in any event, since uh, the London Borough of Tower Hamlets was the highway authority in relation to the H14 bridge, um, it, it could ensure that the bridge didn't become a rat run, that it could provide uh, connectivity for bus services, but that the highway authority would be able to do things to stop it becoming a rat run for cars. I thought that was a very constructive thing for John to say, uh, and we will record that in our, in our minutes. Yep. And I think it has been supportive of it being a bus route, which yes. again is t the TfL engagement. Because okay, that's yes, I, I, I agree that is a, a, a constructive um, and helpful thing. Um, the main decision for these bridges was taken in 2011, which is ages ago. The context has completely changed. We agreed all of that. We not only have a new mayor with new priorities, but we've also got to a point where people, you know, people know we need cleaner air, we need less traffic. Do you think it's time to revisit the planning decision about these bridges? Uh, well, I think some of the context has changed, but not all of the context has changed. The um, planning uh, permission under which this was originally given was around uh, creating connectivity between local communities. And the, and the very important principle of all that's stood behind the very long-term uh, legacy plans and actually some of the other questions uh, about the original aspirations around convergence were that the neighbouring communities around the park should not be cut off from Absolutely. the investment in new housing, new jobs, new schools, and the park and venues itself. And actually, to me, you know, I've, I've just gone past 10 years' involvement in all this, and I think if we, if we made new developments where we actually cut off the neighbouring communities, we'd be completely abandoning uh, the principles I, I'm sorry, about you're not, you're connecting not local communities about into them the being investment. cut off. You've got a really good um, pedestrian bridge there already. People can, can get through. Um, uh, uh, maybe we can look at the H16 new pedestrian bridge, which involves partly demolishing um, Victoria Wharf. Mm. This old warehouse building was absolutely brimming with creative people and small businesses. It should be a thriving and affordable creative hub, the sort of thing that is an engine for a resilient local economy, which we've been talking about this morning. The mayor and the boroughs are trying to work out how to get exactly that sort of creative, energetic economy going with their new um, London Borough of Culture scheme. Mm. Demolition of this building and the creative community it contained is just incredibly destructive. There are people working flat out here upstairs in City Hall who are trying to work out how to create exactly the conditions that you already have at, at Stow Space at Victoria Wharf. Have you considered dropping that pedestrian bridge and keeping people walking on the desire line at Monia Road over the, the H14 bridge instead of destroying this valuable and well-established artistic hub that does a lot for your local economy? Um, maybe a bit of context. So, so the creative uh, workspace in Victoria Wharf was, uh, well, the total workspace uh, was, I think, less than 1,000 square metres. Uh, in uh, Hackney Wick, the master plan we're developing uh, is over 30,000 square metres of uh, workspace, over 8,500 square metres of which will be affordable. So I, we are absolutely committed to protecting, to working with City Hall to protect and sustain creative workspace. The Victoria Wharf occupation, I mean, it's been empty now for, for, for over a year, but it wasn't all uh, cultural. There were, there were food supply businesses and there and other things, I, I, not as well as some of the organisations of the sort you considered. But what we had to look at was the long-term benefit in terms of uh, 
if, of the connectivity we're trying to create and that bridges can contribute to, so that there are that, that linkage to the thousands of homes, schools, uh, and the venues of the park. Can, can I and, and that's, that's the wider picture. So I, we, do understand, we do understand that there was opposition to it, and we've listened to that. OK, can I, can I just come back with a bit of that opposition? Because the, the, um, the, the, the people in Hackney Wick say that actually the, this new space that you've just been talking about is not properly affordable. And they think that in terms of the current um, low-cost studio space, there's only going to be about 10% of what's being lost is going to be able to be refound um, in, in what's being provided. You know, this, this term affordable, we have it in housing, we have it with low-cost studio spaces. You know, affordable, affordable to who? Ordinary Londoners, Londoners with creative small businesses can't afford those kinds of affordable um, rents. But to move on finally, because I'm almost out of time, it is really good that the demolition has been delayed while you do this new um, traffic modelling, and, and that is hugely appreciated. Would you consider extending the delay to give time to consider the implications of demolishing Victoria Wharf to build this new footbridge in relation not only to the Mayor's transport strategy, but also to his culture strategy and his economic development strategy, both of which are due out very shortly? Well, uh, so the Mayor has uh, reviewed our plans uh, relatively recently out of the correspondence that was raised, uh, and the Deputy Mayor wrote, confirming that they saw no reason to intervene, and obviously are mindful of all those uh, strategic work that, we've, that is going on. So we have been told explicitly, uh, and, and the, uh, in, in light of the correspondence that have been with, uh, back to the Mayor's office, that they see no reason to intervene and therefore no reason for us not to continue with the process we're on. Okay. We are looking gonna, at the transport I'm going to have strategy. to ask you for your last statement, just your last words on okay. this. We're, we're doing the work, as you said, in relation to uh, re-looking in the light of the new transport strategy, but beyond that the Mayor has confirmed we should carry on with the plans as we are. Thank, Thank you. you. Any, any other members on this? Everybody's out of time. Um, so there's no questions to your original statements that you started with. All that's left for me to do is to thank you very much for your attendance here today. Thank you. Thank you. And it's about David because I think it's probably his last appearance before this assembly. I love the intervention. I was just wasn't. going to go on and do that. But you know, I'm. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, Follow that man. David, um, we, on behalf of the Assembly, can we thank you for the work that you have done um, with the LLDC on behalf of Londoners? Um, we've heard this morning about the success in, in generation terms that you have brought to a part of London that I know well because I represent the borough of Hackney and Waltham Forest and that regeneration has brought light to an area of London where we didn't have trees. So um, thank you for that success that you've played in regenerating this vital part of London. Thank you for the courtesy and for the professionalism that you've demonstrated um, in a very hot seat over the last, um, certainly last two years, when it comes to um, the financial aspect of this humongous project, financial project. Thank you. Um, we wish you all the very well, all the very best. We hear you're, you're going to the army, is that right? Uh, not not the Ministry of Defence. No. Ministry not, of Defence. Yeah, so that's easy he's, peasy. He's a bit old for the army. <laughs> <laughs> so that There's a vacancy this morning, is it? <laughs> <laughs> that's not so, the role I'm going to. I, I think that's going to be easy peasy compared to where you've been and what you've done, but we wish you all the very, very best. I told, him, I told him he shouldn't go. He shouldn't go. He shouldn't go. And uh, Peter Hendy, thank you for your first, appear first of many appearances before us in wearing your hat as chair of the LLDC. I can't wait. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members. Thank you, thank you for those kind words, chair. Okay, members can go to part B. Can we now turn to the motion set out on the agenda in my name in relation to the question and answer session, namely to note the answers to the questions asked. I now formally move that motion. Is that motion agreed?
Thank you. Okay, uh, let's go to section five. Can I ask Assembly Member O'Connell to present the petition listed on the agenda in the name of Assembly Member Devonish? Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'm delighted on behalf of uh, Tony Devonish to uh, present uh, this petition signed by 1,570 signatories. The lead petitioner is, is here uh, today. It's, it's a lengthy prayer, but I, I will quote it. Quote, I strongly object to Belgravia Police Station public office desk being closed as part of the funding cutbacks that the Metropolitan Police are being forced to make through government policy. Whilst appreciating that much can be done online to report crime, there is no substitute for having a police force both visible and approachable in the local community. For these reasons, I am adding my name and providing my particulars to ask that the Mayor and the Commissioner of Police rethink this strategy. Belgravia Police Station will remain an administrative hub for the Met and I would recommend the following mode of operation take effect. Please bear with me, members, it's lengthy. Rather than keep a trained and valuable police officer on duty, um, then instead access to front desk be granted via a front door bill for anyone seeking assistance. Any of the given police personnel inside could simply attend as and when required, freeing up an officer. This would in itself save the salary of a police officer to attend live matters, but at the same time offer that security that is expected to Belgravia." Unquote. Oh, it's quite heavy. Is it because they can write in Belgravia? Can I ask, <laughs> can I ask the Assembly to agree to forward the petition to the Mayor for a response? Thank you. Thank you. Um, can I ask the Assembly member? Can I ask Assembly member Berry to present the petition listed on the agenda in her name? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair. Uh, yes, I'd like to submit a very similar petition, um, which is from the local people in Streatham. It calls on the Mayor of London not to close Streatham's police base and to keep Streatham's police teams and front counters in Streatham. Uh, there are 554 physical signatures I'm about to hand in. The lead petitioner is uh, Jonathan Bartley, and there's an online petition with a similar um, that has 786 signatures. Um, it, this was submitted by the lead petitioner to uh, the consultation as well, which closed on the 6th of October. And I think it's a bit much that we haven't even had time to have uh, a London Assembly meeting to formally present this to the Mayor before final decisions were made to do the opposite of what petitions are asking for. So yeah, we usually that. just stick to the prayer. <laughs> Can I ask the Assembly to agree to forward the petition to the Mayor please, for a response? Please, please. Thank you. Um, item, item 6, petition update. Can I ask the Assembly to note the responses received to petitions presented at recent Assembly plenary meetings as set out in the report? Thank you. Now we come to item 7, during which Assembly members move motions and debate them. The Chairman will move the motion in her name, viz. This Assembly notes with concern that modern-day slavery persists in London. Modern-day slavery is a crime that is both hidden and in plain sight. It can happen behind closed doors in private homes, in car washes, nail bars or in the supply chains of the goods and services we buy and use. While the details of this crime this is a long motion this while the details of this crime are diverse and complex, one common feature remains the devastating impact on its victims. We commend the work of the Mayor, Metropolitan Police Service, Government, the charity sector and the media to help combat modern day slavery and support victims of this barbaric crime. We welcome the Mayor's pledge for a modern day slavery ambassador for every London borough and urge him to us to ensure this is pursued without exception. Alongside this, we call on the Mayor to ensure that tackling modern day slavery is a priority for this work with London's business community through the Good Work Standard. Unmeshed Asai, Assembly Member, Unmeshed Asai will second the motion. Off you go, Jeanette. Uh, thank you, Chair. 
Chair, um, thank you for uh, reading uh, the motion out for me. And I just want to uh, just say a few words. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, this is, I mean, it's just, it's just beyond words, really, mm. that in 2017, in this chamber, in this city, we are here talking about slavery. But we are. And it's, a, it's an issue that's really frequently misunderstood. The word conjures up images of a bleak and shameful period, a distant relic of a bygone era. Most would think it had been banished to the history books many decades ago. The uncomfortable truth is that slavery is more current than we would care to imagine. Although concealed in the shadows, its poisonous effects are still felt within the capital. This callous practice can be found in the most improbable of places. It could be happening on your doorstep, in your community, at a local business, on your street. To some, the glittering lights of our glorious capital might seem an unlikely home for modern slavery. Yet London's victims, often hidden from sight, are thought to be in <coughs> thousands. Men, women and children are made to work for hours on end and kept captive against their will in, unimagin in unimaginable cruel conditions. And modern slavery can be found across a variety of sectors in manufacturing, fruit, food processing, agriculture, and the beauty industry. I recently uh, spoke to a survivor and she told me she was uh, em uh, employed to do um, childcare. And then after childcare came all the domestic work in the house. And this was a farm, not far from here, on the outskirts in Essex. And then she was told, or asked, what do you know about horses? Because the children had horses. And that was added to her um, <coughs> list of things to do. And you think, okay, she's going to get paid, so why not? She, her pay was held back, and she was forced to sleep in what we would call, if you like, the pantry room adjacent to the kitchen. And her food was the food that was left from the table. That is 2016. I'm not talking about um, the bygone ages. So, this motion, in fact, links to a previous motion that we unanimously supported in 2012. And um, <clears throat> former Assembly member uh, Murad Qureshi brought us, or highlighted for us then, the injustice to domestic workers that was linked to the Tide visa. A.M. Boff with us today, who seconded that motion, said, in making, sorry, in, um, yes, you said that the Tide visa basically made domestic workers in circumstances where they <coughs> were being abused the modern slave within our city and reminded us of the numbers, the huge numbers of people caught in this uh, trap of injustice. So what I'm asking you to do today is to unanimously support this motion for us to send a message that says modern slavery, there is zero tolerance to this in our city. Modern slavery is everybody's business. Let's say to businesses, they have a responsibility to ensure that their supply chain, that every employee that they have is treated fairly and with, within an ethical framework. Let's say to Londoners, we all can play our part. If you are worried about somebody's welfare, if you suspect they might be a victim, you should inform the police as a matter of urgency. I move this motion. Before calling on Assembly Member Desai, can I ask the Assembly please to agree Understanding Order 
to extend the meeting in order to finish the business on the agenda. Would you agree with that? Thank you. Assembly Member Desai. Thank you, Chair. Chair, um, this may be a long motion, but it could have been even longer, because there's so much more that we could, need to, and should be doing to combat this wild trade. Can I start off, and I'm sure all members of the Assembly will join me in making this observe, uh, in commending the Evening Standard uh, on the campaign that they've been running around modern slavery, a fantastic example of campaigning journalism that we don't often see uh, these days. The Archbishop of, of, uh, Archbishop of Westminster made the observation that modern slavery is a dark underbelly of the capital, and it's something that we've got to come to grips with, to combat it, and come to grips with urgently. Uh, as the first paragraph notes, that this trade, is a, uh, this uh, modern slavery is a crime that is both hidden and in plain sight. It's not just about sexual trafficking and exploitation, it's also about, as the motion uh, makes a point, what happens behind closed doors in private homes, car washers, nail bars, in the supply chains of the goods and services that we buy and use. Uh, and that's why the motion makes reference to work with the business community. But let's look at what goes on behind closed doors in private homes. You may have seen the article in yesterday's Evening Standard. City boss, quote, came made just two months off in 12 years, unquote. A housemaid is suing a former boss for more than £230,000, claiming that the financier failed to pay her the minimum wage when she worked for, for him. She says that she worked 18 hours a day, seven days a week. She took only two months and 12 days of holiday. She was expected to work during the weekend as well as during the week. This is all in the claim lodged with the court. She would expect to carry out the same household tasks, but to the further childcare duties as a result of the children not attending school or nursery. Now, in fairness, the employer uh, has uh, vehemently, I'm going to quote the standard, de denied her claims. But this is the sort of issue that we are dealing with in today's uh, London. Um, so, this motion is not just about words, it's a call to action. Things are happening, but as I, as I said earlier, we could do so much more. The mayor does need to be commended, as the second paragraph of the motion notes. He, he talks about um, his, his pledge to have a modern day slavery ambassador in every London borough, which I think is a very welcome state, to tackle issues as and when they happen on the ground. Uh, a modern uh, slavery summit was held in May. There's a modern slavery board, and we asked questions of the Deputy Mayor for Policy at the Police and Crime Committee last week. And as I understand it, the modern slavery board is uh, looking at present at the construction industry. Uh, the Metropolitan Police Service need to be commended as well. Now, I know there was a critical report uh, last week uh, by the HMIC, um, and they made some national observations uh, criticizing police performance in this area. But I can say this, and um, the Assembly Chair and Carolyn and others who were there will bear me out, that we were reassured by what Deputy uh, Commissioner Craig Mack had to tell us. Um, there's a number of things that they're doing. Uh, training, working with police officers abroad, um, um, looking at how to bring more prosecutions, um, working with partners, uh, intervention programs, uh, much more importantly, support for victims, um, uh, and so on. So they do need our support and do need to be commended. As I said, there's much more that they and we all uh, can be doing. Uh, so I join us, uh, the Chair of the Assembly in asking for all party support around this motion, which I'm sure will be forthcoming. But as I said, this motion is not just about words. It's a call for action, something that we need to do now, urgently. Uh, this is a scar on London society in 2017. It's simply unacceptable that these sort of practices go on. Uh, we have the political will, I'm sure, to combat this. And this motion really should spur us on to do so much more. Uh, and this is something that certainly with the Assembly Chair, and hopefully with your support, and particularly for the police committee, uh, I hope we will do some campaigning over the next few months and years. Thank you. Assembly Member Both. Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I, welcome this, uh, I welcome this motion, and from our side, we will be supporting it. I would, however, like to make a few comments about how this is implemented, because it is a good statement to say that we're going to have ambassadors for every borough, but if we leave it at that, then I think actually we're not doing, uh, uh, treating this subject with the seriousness that it deserves. But I, I quizzed the Mayor last time when uh, uh, Assemblymember Arnold uh, addressed the Mayor before, and I quizzed the Mayor where would this, who would this ambassador be, and it would be a police officer. Uh, that's, that's the current idea, which is fine, and that addresses the issues with regard to police. But bearing in mind that the 
government actually today, I think it's today, has published a, a guide for local authorities to identify victims of trafficking, local authorities, education, social services. We must make sure that these single points of contact, these ambassadors for trafficking, ensure that there are structural changes that take place within their local authorities as well in order to identify these victims of, of human trafficking. Uh, I, uh, after doing the report, and, it, it, who's, and the evidence in uh, Shadow City a few years ago, uh, longest report that this group has ever produced, um, the, evidence, the evidence just brought me to tears mm -hmm. about what was happening mm -hmm. in this city. Unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And I've come to the conclusion that you're never more than a few hundred yards away from a victim mm -hmm. of human trafficking. I, I, I truly believe that. But we won't rescue these people, we won't help these people unless we can identify them. And that requires structural changes in local authorities at a time when local authorities have very little money. So if I can just flag this up for the Assembly, is that there's three boroughs that have got together, and what they're doing, and they are Croydon, Southwark and Lambeth. And they have got together, realising that this is a challenge for all those boroughs, all in slightly in different ways, but all those boroughs, yeah. that, but that it's possibly too big a problem for one borough to deal with on their own. Mm. They've got together, and what they've done is that they've, they've uh, put together a project where and mod they're going to modify their MASH teams, their multi-agency mm. safeguarding hubs, mm. to widen the... Uh, widen. Usually those MASH teams are about young people and protecting young people. To widen the remit of those MASH teams to include adults who may be victims of human trafficking. And the reason is, is because in those MASH teams, they already have the multi-agency approach. Yeah. Yeah. If you go to a borough and say, we want you to invent another body mm -hmm. and another set of meetings mm -hmm. for the police, mm -hmm. the local authorities, NGOs and the health service to turn up with, mm -hmm. you're not going to get much of a good positive response. Mm -hmm. However, if, if, if you modify the existing structures within local authorities, you've got much more of a chance of being able to um, uh, being able to cast that expert eye on identifying victims of human trafficking. And because unless, if we just make statements all the time, and it's very easy for us to make statements, but statements we must make to remind the public that this is a problem, that's fine. But we need solid work being done at the borough level in order to identify these victims. And to, if, if anybody's dubious about this, there are victims at this very moment, children, adults, men, women, who are enslaved in this capital, mm. and they are here, they are now, and we've got to take positive action to address it. Thank you. Assembly Member Berry. Thank you, Chair. Um, I agree with a lot of what's been said so far. I'm really proud that there's such unanimity about tackling and better understanding this really important issue. I'm very pleased. Um, so we'll both be supporting the motion. I wanted to just uh, say one or two things about uh, an overlapping group of overlooked Londoners that we've talked about in the Housing Committee recently, which is the, the hidden homeless. I think as part of that investigation, we heard about um, groups such as uh, the um, asylum-seeking women, women for refugee women, spoke to us and told us that there, yeah, there are clearly many, many um, hundreds, if not thousands, of asylum-seeking women who've been made destitute um, as a result of, of, of wider policies um, who are vulnerable to exploitation, that just the kinds of people that fall prey to modern slavery um, organisations and the kinds of employers, the kind of people who will offer you home in exchange for domestic servitude, those people are incredibly vulnerable. And they're just, they're just one group of uh, voiceless Londoners uh, people who've been ignored up to now that really are being given more attention by the, the huge amount of attention that's being given to this issue now by large parts of the establishment. And I think it's, it's a really good thing. Uh, one thing we also highlighted in our report on hidden homelessness was um, that actually putting numbers onto this, um, number, finding out how many people are affected, is really difficult and that current statistics, even on homelessness, don't cover this well. They're not, they're not um, proper statistics yet. Um, I think it's really important that we do 
try and make sure that the resources go into finding out more about the problem, identifying who's affected um, and putting uh, resources into that as well as the things that are in the motion. I think where we, we know more about where these people come from, who they are, we can put more resources into tackling the deeper causes of this too. But I do support the measures in the motion and I'm just really pleased to see it happening. Thank you. Assembly Member Pigeon. Thank you very much indeed. I welcome this motion today and quite rightly it's been an issue that's been raised by many um, London Assembly members over recent years and when I was looking at what I wanted to say in this motion I looked back and saw a motion back in October 2010 from um, uh, my former colleague Baroness D. Ducey and Assembly Member Arnold which particularly focused around children in this area. And at that time, Dee helped organise a powerful exhibition here at City Hall of photographs from the UK, Ireland and other countries around the world demonstrating the daily reality of human trafficking and modern day slavery. So I think the case um, for this motion um, today and indeed further action is overwhelming and we clearly cannot rest on our laurels. And as Assemblymember Desai has already mentioned, only last week HMIC published a hard-hitting report which highlighted, yes, some good work by some police forces, Greater Manchester, West Yorkshire and Cumbria, but worryingly the Met wasn't listed, though we have had some assurances at Police and Crime Committee of their work. Um, it highlighted a number of serious shortcomings of police forces across England and Wales, such as poor and inconsistent coordination and sharing of information and intelligence, low awareness and use of the provisions and powers of the Modern Slavery Act 2015 and a continual attitude that modern-day slavery and human trafficking offences were rare. And I think the reality is that back in 2013, the government estimated that there are around 10,000 and 13,000 potential victims of modern slavery and human trafficking. However, the number is likely to be far, far higher. So the actions called for in the motion today are absolutely necessary, and the need to tackle this horrendous crime uh, must, uh, must come forward and must be effectively tackled. And it's yet another reason why the Metropolitan Police Service must be properly resourced. I commend the motion today. Assembly Member Curtin. Thank you very much. Um, of course, uh, we will support the motion. It's a very, very important thing that needs to be tackled. We think that slavery finished uh, in 1807 with Wilberforce. Of course, it isn't, and it's going on today. But there's a couple of things I think I would add to this which are missing. And that is that uh, this cannot be divorced from immigration. Now we know that net immigration is about 260,000. That's legal. I'm not talking about that, although of course we have a position on that as a party. But there's the illegal immigration that happens. And the recent figures I hear is that on top of the legal net immigration, there's 150,000 perhaps a year, of people coming into the country illegally, being smuggled through people trafficking, people smuggling. This is wrong. And our border force is a joke. We have three tugs patrolling 6,000 miles or so of coastline in ports up and down the east of England and southern England, Immingham and so on, Yarmouth, Lowestoft, and even the beaches uh, around Dimchurch. You see people coming in, uh, occasionally people are noticed coming in with no boat border force there whatsoever. Uh, and this is happening. So 150,000 people a year, this is three or 400 people a day. And many of those are people who have been promised you come to the UK, you're going to have a wonderful life. You, you can be a dancer, you can be a model, you can work on a farm, you can work in a bar like Hollywood, and they get here and they find that they're on a farm, but they're in conditions of slavery, like we've heard before. Or they're sent to a household, and they're put there, and they've got no way of getting in touch with the police or the outside world. Uh, and worse still, some end up uh, in prostitution and sex slavery, or they've been promised other things. We need to beef up our border force, and we need to give the police the resources they need to tackle this issue. And I'm angry because I've been here today listening to the LLDC earlier in the session, and the mismanagement, and £750 million has disappeared somewhere. But that hasn't gone to the police 
and we hear earlier this week, police numbers might be cut from 32,000 down to 27,500 back to the level of 2002, when we need to be increasing our police numbers. We need to be beefing up our police because crime is increasing, slavery is increasing, but these services, these vital services, which protect us and can protect other people from being put into situations of injustice are being run down. So to any strategy that we have to tackle modern slavery, we need to make sure that our border force and our police are given the resources, not just financial, but human resources they need to tackle the issue. So I would urge anyone who considers this in the future to think about those issues as well, because it's something that causes untold misery and it needs to be dealt with. Thank you. Assemblymember Arnold to sum up. Yes, Chair, quickly. Um, thank you, colleagues. Um, can I just say I totally agree, and uh, this is the only way that I can work, is words without action is uh, just not an option. Um, so uh, I and my colleagues and all of us, um, anyone who wants to uh, work along, uh, we will be producing um, an action plan to ensure that whatever it is is going on, we're looking at it and seeing how that is being implemented across London. Um, to, to a colleague, um, Andrew Boff, um, thank you. Um, and thank you for that excellent um, example of three boroughs and uh, working together, you're quite right. One borough, um, you know, this, uh, this thing is too big. It's something that we've got to get on top of. And absolutely the vehicle of the mash add in, um, you know, uh, enslaved or um, adults at risk. That's an ideal vehicle. So I think we should um, write a letter um, just bringing that example to the mayor's attention and, and linking that with any plans or work that's coming out of, of his board so that everybody is working together. And there should not be a need for an extra meeting Let's look at vehicles that we have. Let's look at work that we're doing um, so we can add to it. Um, Caroline, thank you for your support and thank you for reminding me of the 2010 work that I did with uh, Baroness um, Ducey about the enslaved children. I mean, it's just ridiculous, isn't it? And uh, so it's something that we have to uh, keep reminding ourselves that it is an issue of our time still and that we have got to get engaged with that. Um, can I just also now just finish and say thank you to um, David Curtin for, for his support. And just to say to David, um, whilst people are trafficked in the UK from hundreds of countries and every continent, that can't be denied, British nationals are also affected. And the statistic collected by the National Referral Mechanism, a system used to identify victims of human trafficking or modern slavery showed last year the UK featured as the third most prevalent country of origin. So the work that we're doing is for us. It's for our own, right? So let's just focus, you know, our attention on, on that. Um, thank you for your support. And I do uh, want to uh, hand over to the mayor, hand over to the uh, chair, so that we can uh, move to the vote on this motion. Those in favour of the motion, please show. Unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Then let's um, move to the next motion, and that's in the name of Assembly Member Boff. Um, thank you, Chair. Can I first of all address the issue of the amendment that's uh, been submitted here? Um, do you see? <laughs> This motion really wasn't about the Balfour Declaration. <laughs> it was using it about as an example of, of the kind of challenges that TfL um, face when they have to approve uh, advertisements on, 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 the, on the underground. And it, it wasn't, in, in fact, if you read what we put, it was completely neutral. It just stated the facts rather than giving an opinion. I understand that just stating that at the time that it is now with the 100-year uh, uh, anniversary, that's, that sort of provoked a response. And I, I, I understand the amendments. Um, and I'm going to accept them, um, but I feel, feel I should mean it that they kind of missed the point 
of the amendment kind of misses the point of the motion. And that motion is that the Londoners would expect that when they are travelling on, uh, on the underground and they are effectively a captive audience, that that environment should be, uh, should be politically neutral. Um, it shouldn't be something that constantly tries to harangue them to particular political points of view. Um, we've got other areas that we could talk about uh, where, where there are challenges for TfL with regard to uh, its, its approach to certain forms of advertising. Uh, I know one that's pressing on the minds of a number of Assembly members is the idea of um, the state-sponsored um, propaganda company RT.com having, having adverts being published on the underground. Now, I think that's something that we need to deliberate upon, something we need to think about, and we need to balance our, uh, our um, belief in free speech with that of trying to maintain a politically neutral uh, environment. So I do accept the amendment. I very, hope my, I very much hope that my reservations about the amendment are admitted because it really wasn't about the Balfour yeah, Declaration. Yeah. And, and with that, I commend it to the Assembly and hope I will get a, a degree of support. Thank you. OK, call upon Assemblymember Prince. Uh, yes, I reserve my right to speak. Thank you. You reserve your right. Can I um, hear from Assemblymember Dr... Um, Thank you. Um, thank you, Chair. Uh, I thought my life was going to be easy this morning, or this afternoon rather, but the reluctance with which Andrew Boff accepts the amendment makes me very worried. Oh. It worries me on two occasions. The TfL makes decisions on its advertising policies all the time. It makes decisions on the advertising policies which are submitted to them all the time. But we don't get any motions here in the Assembly every time the TfL makes a decision mm -hmm. on these advertising policies. And the fact, right, the reason this amendment was moved right was for three reasons. One, it was historically inaccurate. Secondly, it was to do justice to the Balfour Declaration to which this um, motion was attaching itself to. And thirdly, to make the motion politically acceptable to everyone in the area which is very sensitive uh, to many, many people. The reason this a motion as it stood unamended was inaccurate was that the Balfour Declaration of 2nd November 1917 was merely an indication by the Secretary of, State, by the Secretary of Foreign Affairs at that time, Arthur Balfour, that His Majesty's government was minded to propose the state of Israel. It wasn't the establishment of the state of Israel. The state of Israel wasn't established until 14th of May, 1948. So it was inaccurate historically as it stood. And secondly, the Balfour Statement didn't just talk about the establishment of a homeland for the Jewish people. It talked about also the rights and preserving the rights of the non-Jewish people. It also talked about defending the rights of the Jewish people who were living in other parts of the world. And the Balfour Statement was very welcome. The injustices done to the Jewish people, the injustices on the industrial scales that took place, was right that the world did come out to an outcry what happened and supported that we needed a homeland for the Jewish people. And we support that. But it also does talk about the rights of the non-Jewish people. And it also recognizes the rights of those people. And if you were going to attach the decision of the TfL to the Balfour Declaration, it's right that we, uh, we do justice to the Balfour Declaration and also quote it in its entirety and not put a full stop where you want to put a full stop. So that is why I moved the amendment, to make sure that we do get sensitivity into this issue, that this is a very sensitive issue, and I agree entirely that this, this debate about the Palestine-Israel conflict can't be dealt with just on a poster. I agree with that entirely, and I think uh, that, uh, the, that uh, 
the TFL taking the decision was the right one. And of course, this mayor has to be congratulated that he has strengthened the, uh, the guidelines given to the TFL on this matter. But if they really wanted to congratulate the TFL on its, on its decisions, they could have been handed 100 examples. I really do beg the question of why was it this particular example was being quoted at this particular time. And that's why I was compelled to keep, take the politics out of this motion and make it a, <laughs> something which is sensitive to people and also do justice to Balfour and do justice to the people who are, who are on both sides of this conflict and show the sensitivity that it deserves that we, and hopefully we can all support this unanimously as amended because there's no way we could have supported the way it was originally drafted. Thank you. So I move the motion. Okay. Can I, I move the amendment rather. Can I have the second uh, of the amendment? Second. Uh, formally second. Okay. Um, so uh, it's been second. accepted. So we can go to the debate. And I have Assemblymember Bailey. Um, I will be supporting this motion, but I just want to bring, bring it back to what I believe the motion is about. It's about TfL and what Londoners are exposed to when they travel, particularly on the tube, because you are a captive audience, which I think has been said. I just want to admit it, though, that TfL do, again, and the Mayor, again, need to look at this issue. Because in a city that's currently facing a knife crime epidemic, the high use of acid, etc., there's many violent images on the underground, primarily around films. When you look at film posters, you often see violent images. Only yesterday I saw one with a fellow brandishing a gun as if it was a pen. And I just think we all need to focus on what we expose our children to. Um, the issue of crime in London, particularly knife crime, is cultural in my mind. And a culture of violence, as portrayed in these posters, needs to be challenged. So I will be supporting this, issue, this amendment, but it is about what TfL can control for me, particularly what our young people are exposed to. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Anyone else? Okay, so, um, Assemblymember Prince, you reserved your rights. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chairman. Um, I think it is regrettable that uh, Labour have really missed the sentiment of this motion. Uh, it is true to say that uh, the original motion was inaccurate, uh, and it is quite true that the actual uh, state of Israel was, or came to it being in 1948. So, so fair enough, that should have been corrected. But again, I'm, I'm very sorry, I've got a lot of time and respect for Dr. Shohar, but to, to, make a, a, a big, so to, to make a big speech about Israel on a motion that's to do with advertising on London Underground just doesn't make sense. Uh, this is a motion about advertising on London Underground. It would have been a bad thing to happen had a political statement been made on this issue. And I think TfL have acted quite correctly in this instance. There are instances, as has already been alluded to, where we think perhaps TfL need to tighten up their advertising standards because they are a public body. And I think as a public body, and I think the Mayor recognises this, they have a duty to the public rather than just putting uh, coins in their coffers. So, once again, I think we just need to concentrate on the issue in the original motion, but we also accept the amendments made by Labour, that we congratulate TfL for their actions on this occasion, and we really would like to encourage them to act uh, positively in the future. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Assembly Member Desai, uh, you reserved your rights or did you formally move? But it's my motion now. Okay, no, I'm um, just bringing them back in. You, sorry, remind me, did you. Well, I seconded the amendment. You, you, you formally seconded. I'll have to say. Thank you. Um, Assembly Member Both, um, summation. Very uh, quickly to say that uh, from what uh, Assembly Member Sahota has said, uh, you could have achieved that through amending one word, as far as I can see. But instead, we've, we've just made it look more political. But I've accepted it because I want this to get through. I want to be able to praise TfL when they deserve praise, for, because there are plenty of occasions in the future where we won't be praising them. And I think it's just nice to be able to do that and say, in this instance, you did the right thing. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'd like to put the motion to the vote. Those in favour of the vote of as, the motion? As altered. As altered. As altered. Is that okay? A point of order before we vote? 
I want to know exactly what we're voting on in terms of the amended motion. The um, there's been some sorry, confusion. What, what, sorry, I can't hear you. I'm, I'm slightly confused about what the amendment is. I was notified of a different text in advance that has come round onto the table. So I want to know just I don't clarification know what you've got, I don't on the know what final you've paragraph. Got, what have you got in front of you? Yes, I've got um, a sheet. Um, uh, let me see what she's got in front of her or what she's been shown. No, we have to know what she's got first. Yeah, have you got... Um, Can you just tell me the final paragraph of the amended motion? The final paragraph? Yeah. This Assembly welcomes the action of, of Transport for London in this matter and wishes to convey its thanks to the Commissioner. OK, thank you. That's, that's clearer. That's clear? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so... Yes, and so the vote now is on the motion as altered. As altered because Andrew has accepted. Andrew has accepted the altered motion. And I'd like to go to a vote on that. If Assemblymember Prince is okay with that. We know what we did. Thank you. We thought we knew what we did. That's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's 18, Chair. 18. Any votes against? No votes against, Chair. Okay, so the motion as altered is passed with 18 votes. Okay, let's go then to the next motion. Motion in the name of Assemblymember Russell. Oh, thank you. We support her motion. Road danger. Road danger brought me into politics, and re reducing road danger is what keeps me in politics. And I'm going to start by telling you a story. A child, Zara Adams, who was four years old at the time, was killed on the walk to school with her older siblings. Her buggy went under the wheels of a heavy goods vehicle as it turned on a busy main road just down the road from where I live. She would be 21 years old now, like my daughter, if she hadn't been killed in the road all those years ago. Speed was not a factor in Zara's death, but I'm sharing this to try to explain the absolute horror of sudden road death and the ripples from that affecting families and their communities across London. This is what should get us all out of bed every morning. It is absolutely wrong that there is so much violence, death and injury on our roads. And it is wrong that it is so normalised that people call traffic crashes accidents. They're not accidents. They are the consequence of systemic dangers on our streets that are not being adequately dealt with. And speed is one of those systemic dangers. 2,501 people were killed or seriously injured last year on London streets. That's 2,501 Londoners and their families affected. These terrible crashes are attended by our emergency services who have to deal with the unimaginable horrors at the roadside. This should not be seen as normal. It is a crisis. It's a crisis that stems from our car dependency and our traffic-dominated streets, where for far too long the movement of vehicles has been prioritised over the movement of people who are walking and cycling. This motion is about speed, or rather reducing it to cut risk. There's plenty of evidence that proves the stark physics. You are far more likely to survive a crash if you're hit by a vehicle doing 20 than if they're doing 30 or 40 miles an hour. And for those of you who are thinking, ha, huh, 20 mph limits will slow down our city. London must keep moving. I met with TfL officers yesterday. I heard that there is good evidence to show that 20 mph limits do not increase journey time. They may even smooth out the traffic and improve the reliability of our vehicle trips. Now, the mayor is doing something very interesting. He's promised a vision zero approach to reducing road danger. Vision zero means aiming for zero 
casualties. That's 2,501 2, fewer crashes that kill and injure Londoners in a typical year. And the Mayor has got to work out how he's going to deliver that change. I've been visiting some of London's most hostile roads and junctions as part of my investigation into walking and cycling in outer London boroughs. There's often not even a basic level of service for people who want to cross the road, for those people who are walking to school, to work or the shops. If the Mayor is going to clean up our air and meet his targets to get 80% of us walking, cycling or taking the bus every day, he's going to need a massive shift away from people in cars by 2041. And that means making sure that the roads across our city feel like places where it is safe and a pleasure to walk or cycle. Slower speeds and considerate driver behaviour are going to be absolutely fundamental to the Mayor achieving that. The Mayor has already committed in his draft transport strategy to introduce lower speeds in London. Making 20 miles an hour the default speed limit on transport for Le London roads, where there is a pavement and where people walk, would transform our city and be a real tribute to all those people who have lost their lives and to their devastated families and friends. You never stop grieving for a lost friend or family member. And we should make sure that the way we manage our roads in London going forward is a tribute to every Londoner who has been killed or seriously injured while walking or cycling in our city. I move the motion. Uh, can I call upon the seconder, Assemblymember Berry? I'd like to formally second and, <clears throat> and reserve my right to speak later. Thank you. Uh, we have an amendment. Uh, call upon Assemblymember Copley to move his amendment. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I won't say very much about this. I think Assemblymember Russell spoke uh, very passionately about the motion, which we broadly agree with. But just a slight amendment uh, to recognise the fact that there may be some roads where a, 20, a TfL roads where a 20 mile limit is not uh, appropriate, but certainly broadly supporting uh, the sentiment uh, of the motion that's been tabled. And uh, amendment seconded by um, Assemblymember Cooper. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, I want to say a couple of words as well. Um, obviously, Assemblymember Copley has indicated that we are broadly supporting the motion. Um, uh, and I myself have also campaigned long and hard on introduction of 20 mile an hour zones. Um, and I'm very pleased to say there's now a large number of London boroughs, including my own borough of Wandsworth, where I moved a motion on making the entire borough 20 mile an hour in all the roads that are borough roads um, in 2011, so some six years ago now. Um, and it's very clear that the Mayor's transport strategy, the draft strategy has been out, is clearly aiming to move from 67% um, where we are now with walking and cycling and public transport to 80%. The whole thrust, if you listen to Deputy Mayor Val Shawcross and the Mayor talking about what they want to achieve with transport is uh, not just about speed reductions but is also about reducing overall the number of cars on the roads. So while I strongly support the introduction of 20 miles an hour and I, I, I commend those councils um, who've, who've gone ahead and done that, I think while I think the whole borough approach is best, there are boroughs that have not yet made that decision. And I think we do have to respect the democratic process in those boroughs and we have to respect that local people will want to make their own decisions. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a principle that we're very um, sensible to observe in terms of not just uh, the democratic decision-making process, but also having some flexibility and introducing limits where they are appropriate. And I think that's the, that's the thrust of the change that we've made to this motion. Um, whilst quite uh, some stretches of the Transport for London road network um, can also be um, turned over to being 20 miles an hour, like the borough approach, it should only be where it's appropriate. And I'm afraid there are some roads in London which do have pavements that people do um, walk along the edges of where I don't think it would be realistic or appropriate to do that. Um, for example, the South Circular is one of those roads. Some parts of the North Circular, the A1, the A2 or the A3. Um, so I think it is something that has to be proportionate, appropriate. We have to be more flexible. And that's why I am seconding the amendments that we're making to this motion, which we think would improve it. Thank you. Okay, um, you formally 
moved and reserved your right to speak, Assemblymember Berry. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm obviously I'm supportive of uh, Caroline, my colleague's uh, motion. Um, I'm not in favour of the amendment. Um, I think it's it's a bit of a penny pinching amendment, to be honest. Um, I mean. We need to be taking Vision Zero as our guide. The Mayor has said this. I don't think we should be waiting, we shouldn't be trialling, testing, piloting this anymore because I think the evidence is there. Making anything other than 20 miles per hour a very rare exception is the goal of this motion. And I think that the pavement rule, as it has laid out there, is a really, really sensible one. I'd like to invite Assemblymember Cooper to come and stand on these bits of the North Circular, uh, the A1, the A2, the A3 with us. Um, if you put in place the pavement rule, as we've suggested, um, and it turns out that actually that bit of road with that bit of pavement, maybe the answer is to move the pavement. Maybe the answer is if that bit of pavement is completely separated from houses and shops and streets, maybe we need to change where the walking route is. But we should not have anyone being made to stand um, next to 40 miles per hour roads in the middle of our city. It's becoming an anachronism. And I think we all, those of us who live in 20 mile per hour boroughs, I think we know the shock that we feel. I'm in Camden. The shock I feel when I go out onto um, the, the Transport for London route network, I can immediately tell I'm there because the traffic becomes thunderous. It becomes threatening. It, become, it is no longer a pleasant place. To, to walk, to wait for a bus, um, and you wouldn't fancy cycling along Camden Road and, and Euston Road. And other bits of London I know well, like the, the A40 um, in Hillingdon, Ealing, the A4, the, as the Cromwell Road goes out to the Hammersmith flyover. Those are very, very hostile streets. And I think it is something that the Mayor absolutely should be doing, is taking a lead on this. As Caroline said, higher speeds than are safe, higher than are civilised, higher than are supporting the rest of the Mayor's transport strategy are a systemic danger and it's one that it's so simple to deal with, with a speed limit. Um, this does not involve long-term investment plans, it's a speed limit, it's a really simple thing and I don't see why we should be the ones toning down our language to say where appropriate. We should make a strong recommendation to the Mayor of how far he should be going because we do know this as an Assembly and that is our role in, in, in this Chamber. Assemblymember Curtin. Oh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Madam Chairman. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm going to vote against this motion. Uh, 30 miles an hour has always been the standard speed limit in urban areas, and I think most people in outer London particularly who drive cars in outer London, because it's very different to inner London there, uh, are in support of maintaining uh, the speed limit on most roads as 30 miles an hour. But when it comes to what the Mayor is responsible for and what TfL are responsible for, TfL are responsible for the red routes, the other routes in London, the other roads in London are the, um, uh, in the purview of local uh, authorities. But with TfL routes, they're trunk routes. They need, in some cases, higher speed limits than 30 because there's a lot of lorries, service vehicles, sometimes emergency vehicles, uh, bringing things and goods in and out of London. And if we reduce uh, the speed limit on some of those roads, which were meant to be dual carriageways, which are meant to uh, have fast traffic coming in and out of London, like the A2, the A20, the A3, and so on, and we put those, the speed limits down to 20 miles an hour, traffic will grind to a halt. And we've heard evidence in the Transport Committee from uh, bus companies and bus drivers who say it's very frustrating, even on a bus lane, uh, if the speed limit is 20 miles an hour, you want to get going if you can, and not be slowed down artificially. Uh, and this causes a lot of frustration for drivers and then stress and then they can do things which they wouldn't do otherwise. So um, I think the speed limit in general uh, needs to say at 30, that's a, it's a good uh, speed limit that's safe enough uh, but also uh, limits the speed on, on normal urban roads uh, but then have higher speed limits on the trunk roads which are mainly operated by TfL. So we're going to vote against the motion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Assemblymember Pigeon. Just quickly, I wasn't going to speak because of time, but I, I do support this motion that's before us today. I think it's, it's really important. It's good for our communities in London to have 20 mile per hour 
um, speed limits and many of us who have been councillors or are councillors have long campaigned to make sure we bring in 20 mile an hour zones that can be um, self-enforced to make sure that we slow down vehicles on our streets because they are a danger and we know that more people survive if they're hit at 20 miles an hour than other speed limits and we do need to make sure our streets are safe for everyone in our community. Um, it also allows eye contact. If, if vehicles are travelling slower and you've got rid of barriers, you've got that eye contact, it makes the whole street scene safer. Uh, and the evidence about buses, I'm sorry, um, Assemblymember Curtin, I think you are misrepresenting that. The evidence we had was that bus drivers, because they were on a time schedule, that is how the bus companies get paid, were having to go faster in order to meet those. And actually they needed to have um, more safety measures built into their schedule in order that they could drive at an appropriate speed and not be penalised as a result. So I support this motion. I think we should be bold, but if that, that um, motion, as, as it's set out, doesn't get through, then I will be supporting the amended motion because we do need to have as many 20-mile-an-hour zones in London and particularly on our red routes. OK, so um, that's all the debate. Um, well, uh, uh, can I call upon... A, sorry? <laughs> it's okay. It's Russell. Uh, summation. Yes, indeed. This, I, I find it really, really worrying that we are trying to water down. It's very specific what I said. I said where there are pavements and people are walking. I told you in my main speech about the people who are killed and seriously injured. That's just over two and a half thousand of them last year in, um, in London. But there were 27,769 people who were slightly injured. Those slight injuries devastate your everyday life. If you've broken your ankle, been, you know, had a slight injury, you might not be able to go to work. You might not be able to keep paying your rent. These injuries are affecting Londoners' lives on an everyday basis. So, I, I just, you know, the, the talk of the idea that the A1 is a trunk road. As the A1 passes through Islington, it may be a trunk road, it may, on a map, it may go all the way to Edinburgh, but as it passes through Islington, it is a road where people live above the shops, where people need to try and cross the road, where people, there's a petition out at the moment to get a, 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 a crossing across that road because people are trying to live their lives surrounded by massive vehicles yeah, pounding through road. our communities. So I don't accept the amendment. I am going to stand by the original motion. Um, it is simply calling for us to make sure that the people who are walking along our roads, who are trying to get across the road to get their kids to the shops, to, the, to school, to get themselves to work, that those people can do it and be secure that they're going to get home safely in the evening. So I continue to move the motion and don't support the amendment. Uh, yeah, that's clear. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, we now move, move to a vote for the amendment. Can I see those in favour of the amendment? Mm. Nine votes in favour of the amendment, Chair. Nine votes in favour of the amendment. Do, can I see those against the amendment? Ten against, Chair. Ten against. The amendment falls. Can I then see those now um, in support of the motion? in the name of Assemblymember Russell. Three, four, Chair. Three, can I see those against? Seven against, Chair. <laughs> Seven against. Yes, Chair. Caroline Russell, your motion falls. Thank you for letting me know, Assemblymember Arnold. Let's then move to item eight. Date of next meeting. The next meeting at London Assembly is scheduled to be the Mayor's Question Time meeting. 
which will take place at 10 a.m. on Thursday, 16th of November, in this chamber at City Hall. And uh, there's no other business. And see you all later at People's Question Time in Dagenham. People's Republic of Dagenham. GLA Chamber Sound. 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 GLA Chamber Sound 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 GLA Chamber